Chapter 10 of Walden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 10 Baker Farm. Sometimes I rambled to pine groves standing like temples, or like fleets at sea, full rigged with wavy boughs and rippling with light, so soft and green and shady that the druids would have forsaken their oaks to worship in them or to the cedar wood beyond flint's pond where the trees covered with hoary blueberries spring higher and higher are fit to stand before valhalla and the creeping juniper covers the ground with wreaths full of fruit or to swamps where the usnea lichen hangs in festoons from the white spruce trees and toadstools round tables of the swamp gods cover the ground and more beautiful fungi adorn the stumps, like butterflies or shells, vegetable winkles. Where the swamp pink and dogwood grow, the red alderberry glows like eyes of imps. The waxwork grooves and crushes the hardest woods in its folds, and the wild hollyberries make the beholder forget his home with their beauty, and he is dazzled and tempted by nameless other wild forbidden fruits too fair for mortal taste. Instead of calling on some scholar, I paid many a visit to particular trees of kinds which are rare in this neighborhood, standing far away in the middle of some pasture, or in the depths of a wood or swamp, or on a hilltop, such as the black birch, of which we have some handsome specimens two feet in diameter. Its cousin, the yellow birch, with its loose golden vest, perfumed like the first. The beech, which has so neat a bowl and beautifully lichen-painted, perfect in all its details, of which, excepting scattered specimens, I know but one small grove of sizable trees left in the township, supposed by some to have been planted by the pigeons that were once baited with beech-nuts nearby. It is worth the while to see the silver grain sparkle when you split this wood. The bass, the hornbeam, the celtus occidentalis, or false elm, of which we have but one well grown. Some taller mast of a pine, a shingle tree, or a more perfect hemlock than usual, standing like a pagoda in the midst of the woods, and many others I could mention. These were the shrines I visited both summer and winter. Once it chanced that I stood in the very abutment of a rainbow's arch, which filled the lower stratum of the atmosphere, tinging the grass and leaves around, and dazzling me as if I looked through colored crystal. It was a lake of rainbow light, in which for a short while I lived like a dolphin. If it had lasted longer, it might have tinged my employments and life. As I walked on the railroad causeway, I used to wonder at the halo of light around my shadow, and would fain fancy myself one of the elect. One who visited me declared that the shadows of some Irishmen before him had no halo about them, that it was only natives that were so distinguished. Benvenuto Cellini tells us in his memoirs that, after a certain terrible dream or vision which he had during his confinement in the castle of St. Angelo, a resplendent light appeared over the shadow of his head at morning and evening, whether he was in Italy or France, and it was particularly conspicuous when the grass was moist with dew. This was probably the same phenomenon to which I have referred, which is especially observed in the morning, but also at other times, and even by moonlight. Though a constant one, it is not commonly noticed, and in the case of an excitable imagination, like Cellini's, it would be basis enough for superstition. Beside, he tells us that he showed it to very few. But are they not indeed distinguished who are conscious that they are regarded at all? I set out one afternoon to go a-fishing to Fairhaven through the woods, to eke out my scanty fare of vegetables. My way led through Pleasant Meadow, an adjunct of the Baker Farm, that retreat of which a poet has since sung, beginning, Thy entry is a pleasant field, which some mossy fruit-trees yield. 
partly to a ruddy brook by gliding musquash undertook and mercurial trout darting about i thought of living there before i went to walden i hooked the apples leaped the brook and scared the musquash and the trout it was one of those afternoons which seemed indefinitely long before one in which many events may happen a large portion of our natural life though it was already half spent when i started by the way there came up a shower which compelled me to stand half an hour under a pine piling boughs over my head and wearing my handkerchief for a shed and when at length i had made one cast over the pickerel weed standing up to my middle in water i found myself suddenly in the shadow of a cloud and the thunder began to rumble with such emphasis that i could do no more than listen to it the gods must be proud thought i with such forked flashes to rout a poor unarmed fisherman so i made haste for shelter to the nearest hut which stood half a mile from any road but so much the nearer to the pond and had long been uninhabited and here a poet builded in the completed years for behold a trivial cabin that to destruction steers so the muse fables but therein as i found dwelt now john field an irishman and his wife and several children from the broad-faced boy who assisted his father at his work and now came running by his side from the bog to escape the rain to the wrinkled sibyl-like cone-headed infant that sat upon its father's knee as in the palaces of nobles and looked out from its home in the midst of wet and hunger inquisitively upon the stranger with the privilege of infancy not knowing but it was the last of a noble line and the hope and cynosure of the world instead of john field's poor starving brat there we sat together under that part of the roof which leaked the least while it showered and thundered without i had sat there many times of old before the ship was built that floated his family to america an honest hard-working but shiftless man plainly was john field and his wife she too was brave to cook so many successive dinners in the recesses of that lofty stove with round greasy face and bare breast still thinking to improve her condition one day with the never absent mop in one hand and yet no effects of it visible anywhere the chickens which had also taken shelter here from the rain stalked about the room like members of the family too humanized methought to roast well they stood and looked in my eye or pecked at my shoe significantly meanwhile my host told me his story how hard he worked bogging for a neighboring farmer turning up a meadow with a spade or bog hoe at the rate of ten dollars an acre and the use of the land with manure for one year and his little broad-faced son worked cheerfully at his father's side the while not knowing how poor a bargain the latter had made i tried to help him with my experience telling him that he was one of my nearest neighbors and that i too who came a-fishing here and looked like a loafer was getting my living like himself that i lived in a tight light and clean house which hardly cost more than the annual rent of such a ruin as his commonly amounts to and how if he chose he might in a month or two build himself a palace of his own that i did not use tea nor coffee nor butter nor milk nor fresh meat and so did not have to work to get them again as i did not work hard i did not have to eat hard and it cost me but a trifle for my food but as he began with tea and coffee and butter and milk and beef he had to work hard to pay for them and when he had worked hard he had to eat hard again to repair the waste of his system and so it was as broad as it was long indeed it was broader than it was long for he was discontented and wasted his life into the bargain and yet he had rated it as a gain in coming to america that here you could get tea and coffee and meat every day but the only true america is that country where you are at liberty to pursue such a mode of life as may enable you to do without these 
and where the state does not endeavor to compel you to sustain the slavery and war and other superfluous expenses which directly or indirectly result from the use of such things. For I purposely talked to him as if he were a philosopher, or desired to be one. I should be glad if all the meadows on the earth were left in a wild state, if that were the consequence of men's beginning to redeem themselves. A man will not need to study history to find out what is best for his own culture. But, alas, the culture of an Irishman is an enterprise to be undertaken with a sort of moral bog-ho. I told him that, as he worked so hard at bogging, he required thick boots and stout clothing, which yet were soon soiled and worn out. But I wore light shoes and thin clothing, which cost not half so much though he might think that I was dressed like a gentleman, which, however, was not the case, and in an hour or two without labor, but as a recreation, I could, if I wished, catch as many fish as I should want for two days, or earn enough money to support me a week. If he and his family would live simply, they might all go a huckleberrying in the summer for their amusement. John heaved a sigh at this, and his wife stared with arms akimbo, and both appeared to be wondering if they had capital enough to begin such a course with, or arithmetic enough to carry it through. It was sailing by dead reckoning to them, and they saw not clearly how to make their port so. Therefore, I suppose they still take life bravely, after their fashion, face to face, giving it tooth and nail, not having skill to split its massive columns with any fine entering wedge and route it in detail, thinking to deal with it roughly, as one should handle a thistle. But they fight at an overwhelming disadvantage. Living, John Field, alas, without arithmetic, and failing so. Do you ever fish? I asked. Oh, yes, I catch a mess now and then, when I am lying by. Good perch, I catch. What's your bait? I catch shiners with fishworms, and bait the perch with them. You'd better go now, John, said his wife, with glistening and hopeful face. But John demurred. The shower was now over, and a rainbow above the eastern woods promised a fair evening, so I took my departure. When I had got without, I asked for a drink hoping to get a sight of the well-bottom to complete my survey of the premises. But there, alas, are shallows and quicksands, and rope broken withal, and bucket irrecoverable. Meanwhile, the right culinary vessel was selected, water was seemingly distilled, and, after consultation and long delay, passed out to the thirsty one. Not yet suffered to cool, not yet to settle. Such gruel sustains life here, I thought. So, shutting my eyes, and excluding the motes by a skillfully directed undercurrent, I drank to genuine hospitality the heartiest draught I could. I am not squeamish in such cases, when manners are concerned. As I was leaving the Irishman's roof after the rain, bending my steps again to the pond, my haste to catch pickerel, wading in retired meadows, in sloughs and bog-holes, in forlorn and savage places, appeared for an instant trivial to me who had been sent to school and college. But as I ran down the hill toward the reddening west, with the rainbow over my shoulder and some faint tinkling sounds borne to my ear through the cleansed air, from I know not what quarter, my good genius seemed to say, Go fish and hunt, far and wide, day by day, farther and wider, and rest thee by many brooks and hearthsides without misgiving. Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Rise free from care before the dawn, and seek adventures. Let the noon find thee by other lakes, and the night overtake thee everywhere at home. There are no larger fields than these, no worthier games than may here be played. Grow wild according to thy nature, like these sedges and brakes which will never become English Bay. Let the thunder rumble. What if it threaten ruin to farmers' crops? 
that is not its errand to thee. Take shelter under the cloud while they flee to carts and sheds. Let not to get a living be thy trade, but thy sport. Enjoy the land, but own it not. Through want of enterprise and faith, men are where they are, buying and selling, and spending their lives like serfs. O Baker Farm! Landscape where the richest element is a little sunshine innocent. No one runs to revel on thy rail-fenced lee. To bait with no man hast thou, with questions art never perplexed. As tame at the first sight as now, in thy plain russet gabardine dressed. Come ye who love, and ye who hate, children of the holy dove, and Guy Fox of the state, and hang conspiracies from the tough rafters of the trees. Men come tamely home at night only from the next field or street, where their household echoes haunt and their life pines because it breathes its own breath over again. Their shadows, morning and evening, reach farther than their daily steps. We should come home from far, from adventures and perils, and discoveries every day with new experience and character. Before I had reached the pond, some fresh impulse had brought out John Field, with altered mind, letting go bogging ere this sunset. But he, poor man, disturbed only a couple of fins while I was catching a fair string, and he said it was his luck. But when we changed seats in the boat, luck changed seats too. Poor John Field! I trust he does not read this, unless he will improve by it, thinking to live by some derivative old country mode in this primitive new country, to catch perch with shiners. It is good bait sometimes, I allow. With his horizon all his own, yet he a poor man, born to be poor, with his inherited Irish poverty or poor life, his Adam's grandmother in boggy ways, not to rise in this world, he nor his posterity, till their wading, web, bog-trotting feet get to Laria to their heels. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Walden this LibriVox recording is in the public domain Walden by Henry David Thoreau chapter eleven higher laws as I came home through the woods with my string of fish trailing my pole it being now quite dark I caught a glimpse of a woodchuck stealing across my path and felt a strange thrill of savage delight and was strongly tempted to seize and devour him raw. Not that I was hungry then, except for that wildness which he represented. Once or twice, however, while I lived at the pond, I found myself ranging the woods like a half-starved hound, with a strange abandonment, seeking some kind of venison which I might devour, and no morsel could have been too savage for me. The wildest scenes had become unaccountably familiar. I found in myself, and still find, an instinct toward a higher, or, as it is named, spiritual life, as do most men, and another toward a primitive, rank, and savage one, and I reverence them both. I love the wild not less than the good. The wildness and adventure that are in fishing still recommended it to me. I like sometimes to take rank hold on life and spend my day more as the animals do. Perhaps I have owed to this employment and to hunting, when quite young, my closest acquaintance with nature. They early introduce us to, and detain us in, scenery with which otherwise at that age we should have little acquaintance. Fishermen, hunters, woodchoppers, and others spending their lives in the fields and woods, in a peculiar sense a part of nature themselves, are often in a more favorable mood for observing her in the intervals of their pursuits than philosophers or poets even who approach her with expectation she is not afraid to exhibit herself to them 
the traveler on the prairie is naturally a hunter on the headwaters of the missouri and columbia a trapper and at the falls of st mary a fisherman he who is only a traveler learns things at second hand and by the halves and is poor authority we are most interested when science reports what those men already know practically or instinctively for that alone is a true humanity or account of human experience they mistake who assert that the yankee has few amusements because he has not so many public holidays and men and boys do not play so many games as they do in england for here the more primitive but solitary amusements of hunting fishing and the like have not yet given place to the former Almost every New England boy among my contemporaries shouldered a fowling piece between the ages of ten and fourteen, and his hunting and fishing grounds were not limited, like the preserves of an English nobleman, but were more boundless even than those of a savage. No wonder, then, that he did not oftener stay to play on the common. But already a change is taking place, owing not to an increased humanity, but to an increased scarcity of game for perhaps the hunter is the greatest friend of the animals hunted, not excepting the humane society. Moreover, when at the pond, I wish sometimes to add fish to my fare for variety. I have actually fished from the same kind of necessity that the first fishers did. Whatever humanity I might conjure up against it was all factitious, and concerned my philosophy more than my feelings. I speak of fishing only now for I had long felt differently about fowling, and sold my gun before I went to the woods. Not that I am less humane than others, but I did not perceive that my feelings were much affected. I did not pity the fishes nor the worms. This was habit. As for fowling, during the last years that I carried a gun, my excuse was that I was studying ornithology, and sought only new or rare birds but i confess that i am now inclined to think that there is a finer way of studying ornithology than this it requires so much closer attention to the habits of the birds that if for that reason only i have been willing to omit the gun yet notwithstanding the objection on the score of humanity i am compelled to doubt if equally valuable sports are ever substituted for these and when some of my friends have asked me anxiously about their boys, whether they should let them hunt, I have answered yes, remembering that it was one of the best parts of my education. Make them hunters, though sportsmen only at first, if possible, mighty hunters at last, so that they shall not find game large enough for them in this or any vegetable wilderness. Hunters as well as fishers of men. Thus far I am of the opinion of Chaucer's nun, who gave not of the text a pulled hen that saith that hunters be not holy men. There is a period in the history of the individual, as of the race, when the hunters are the best men, as the Algonquins called them. We cannot but pity the boy who has never fired a gun, he is no more humane while his education has been sadly neglected. This was my answer with respect to those youths who were bent on this pursuit, trusting that they would soon outgrow it. No humane being past the thoughtless age of boyhood will wantonly murder any creature which holds its life by the same tenure that he does. The hare in its extremity cries like a child. I warn you, mothers, that my sympathies do not always make the usual philanthropic distinctions. Such is often the young man's introduction to the forest, and the most original part of himself. He goes thither at first as a hunter and fisher, until at last, if he has the seeds of a better life in him, he distinguishes his proper objects, as a poet or a naturalist, it may be, and leaves the gun and fish-pole behind. The mass of men are still in all ways young in this respect. In some countries, a hunting parson is no uncommon sight. Such a one might make a good shepherd's dog, but it is far from being a good shepherd. I have been surprised to consider that the only obvious employment, except wood-chopping, ice-cutting, or the like business, 
which ever, to my knowledge, detained at Walden Pond for a whole half day any of my fellow citizens, whether fathers or children of the town, with just one exception, was fishing. Commonly they did not think that they were lucky or well paid for their time unless they got a long string of fish, though they had the opportunity of seeing the pond all the while. They might go there a thousand times before the sediment of fishing would sink to the bottom and leave their purpose pure. But no doubt such a clarifying process would be going on all the while. The governor and his council faintly remember the pond, for they went a-fishing there when they were boys, but now they are too old and dignified to go a-fishing, and so they know it no more forever. Yet even they expect to go to heaven at last. If the legislature regards it, it is chiefly to regulate the number of hooks to be used there. But they know nothing about the hook of hooks with which to angle for the pond itself, impaling the legislature for a bait. Thus, even in civilized communities, the embryo man passes through the hunter stage of development. I have found repeatedly of late years that I cannot fish without falling a little in self-respect. I have tried it again and again. I have skill at it, and like many of my fellows, a certain instinct for it, which revives from time to time. But always when I have done, I feel that it would have been better if I had not fished. I think that I do not mistake. It is a faint intimation, yet so are the first streaks of morning. There is unquestionably this instinct in me which belongs to the lower orders of creation, yet with every year I am less a fisherman, though without more humanity or even wisdom. At present I am no fisherman at all. But I see that if I were to live in a wilderness I should again be tempted to become a fisher and hunter in earnest. Beside, there is something essentially unclean about this diet, and all flesh, and I began to see where housework commences, and whence the endeavor, which costs so much, to wear a tidy and respectable appearance each day, to keep the house sweet and free from all ill odors and sights. Having been my own butcher and scullion and cook, as well as the gentleman for whom the dishes were served up, I can speak from an unusually complete experience. The practical objection to animal food, in my case, was its uncleanliness, and besides, when I had caught and cleaned and cooked and eaten my fish, they seemed not to have fed me, essentially. It was insignificant and unnecessary, and cost more than it came to. A little bread or a few potatoes would have done as well with less trouble and filth. Like many of my contemporaries, I had rarely for many years used animal food or tea or coffee, etc., not so much because of any ill effects which I had traced to them, as because they were not agreeable to my imagination. The repugnance to animal food is not the effect of experience, but is an instinct. It appeared more beautiful to live low and fare hard in many respects, and though I never did so, I went far enough to please my imagination. I believe that every man who has ever been earnest to preserve his higher or poetic faculties in the best condition has been particularly inclined to abstain from animal food and from much food of any kind. It is a significant fact stated by entomologists. I find it in Kirby and Spence that some insects in their perfect state, though furnished with organs of feeding, make no use of them and they lay it down as a general rule that almost all insects in this state eat much less than in that of larvae. The voracious caterpillar, when transformed into a butterfly, and the gluttonous maggot, when become a fly, content themselves with a drop or two of honey or some other sweet liquid. The abdomen under the wings of the butterfly still represents the larva. This is the tidbit which tempts his insectivorous fate. The gross feeder is a man in the larva state, and there are whole nations in that condition, nations without fancy or imagination, whose vast abdomens betray them. It is hard to provide and cook so simple and clean a diet as will not offend the imagination. But this, I think, is to be fed when we feed the body. They should both sit down at the same table. 
yet perhaps this may be done. The fruits eaten temperately need not make us ashamed of our appetites, nor interrupt the worthiest pursuits. But put an extra condiment into your dish, and it will poison you. It is not worth the while to live by rich cookery. Most men would feel shame if caught preparing with their own hands precisely such a dinner, whether of animal or vegetable food, as is every day prepared for them by others. Yet, till this is otherwise, we are not civilized, and, if gentlemen and ladies, are not true men and women. This certainly suggests what change is to be made. It may be vain to ask why the imagination will not be reconciled to flesh and fat. I am satisfied that it is not. Is it not a reproach that man is a carnivorous animal? True, he can and does live, in a great measure, by preying on other animals, but this is a miserable way, as any one who will go to snaring rabbits or slaughtering lambs may learn, and he will be regarded as a benefactor of his race who shall teach man to confine himself to a more innocent and wholesome diet. Whatever my own practice may be, I have no doubt that it is a part of the destiny of the human race, in its gradual improvement, to leave off eating animals, as surely as the savage tribes have left off eating each other when they came in contact with the more civilized. If one listens to the faintest but constant suggestions of his genius, which are certainly true, he sees not to what extremes or even insanity it may lead him. And yet that way, as he grows more resolute and faithful, his road lies. The faintest assured objection which one healthy man feels will at length prevail over the arguments and customs of mankind. No man ever followed his genius till it misled him. Though the result were bodily weakness, yet perhaps no one can say that the consequences were to be regretted, for these were a life in conformity to higher principles. If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy, and life emits a fragrance like flowers and sweet-scented herbs, is more elastic, more starry, more immortal, that is your success. All nature is your congratulation, and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. The greatest gains and values are farthest from being appreciated. We easily come to doubt if they exist. We soon forget them. They are the highest reality. Perhaps the facts most astounding and most real are never communicated by man to man. The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It is a little stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. Yet, for my part, I was never unusually squeamish. I could sometimes eat a fried rat with a good relish if it were necessary. I am glad to have drunk water so long, for the same reason that I prefer the natural sky to an opium-eater's heaven. I would fain keep sober always, and there are infinite degrees of drunkenness. I believe that water is the only drink for a wise man. Wine is not so noble a liquor. And think of dashing the hopes of a morning with a cup of warm coffee, or of an evening with a dish of tea. Ah, how low I fall when I am tempted by them. Even music may be intoxicating. Such apparently slight causes destroyed Greece and Rome, and will destroy England and America. Of all ebriosity, who does not prefer to be intoxicated by the air he breathes? I have found it to be the most serious objection to coarse labors long continued that they compelled me to eat and drink coarsely also. But to tell the truth, I find myself at present somewhat less particular in these respects. I carry less religion to the table, ask no blessing. Not because I am wiser than I was, but I am obliged to confess, because, however much it is to be regretted, with years I have grown more coarse and indifferent. Perhaps these questions are entertained only in youth as most believe of poetry. My practice is nowhere, my opinion is here. Nevertheless, I am far from regarding myself as one of those privileged ones to whom the Ved refers when it says that 
he who has true faith in the omnipresent supreme being may eat all that exists that is is not bound to inquire what is his food or who prepares it and even in their case it is to be observed as a hindu commentator has remarked that the vedant limits this privilege to the time of distress who has not sometimes derived an inexpressible satisfaction from his food in which appetite had no share i have been thrilled to think that i owed a mental perception to the commonly gross sense of taste that i have been inspired through the palate that some berries which i had eaten on a hillside had fed my genius the soul not being mistress of herself says tseng Tzu, one looks and one does not see one listens and one does not hear one eats and one does not know the savor of food he who distinguishes the true savor of his food can never be a glutton he who does not cannot be otherwise a puritan may go to his brown bread crust with as gross an appetite as ever an alderman to his turtle not that food which entereth into the mouth defileth a man but the appetite with which it is eaten it is neither the quality nor the quantity but the devotion to sensual savours when that which is eaten is not a viand to sustain our animal or inspire our spiritual life but food for the worms that possess us. If the hunter has a taste for mud turtles, muskrats, and other such savage tidbits, the fine lady indulges a taste for jelly made of a calf's foot, or for sardines from over the sea, and they are even. He goes to the mill pond, she to her preserve pot. The wonder is how they, how you and I, can live this slimy, beastly life, eating and drinking. Our whole life is startlingly moral. There is never an instant's truce between virtue and vice. Goodness is the only investment that never fails. In the music of the harp which trembles round the world, it is the insisting on this which thrills us. The harp is the traveling patterer for the universe's insurance company, recommending its laws, and our little goodness is all the assessment that we pay. Though the youth at last grows indifferent, the laws of the universe are not indifferent, but are forever on the side of the most sensitive. Listen to every zephyr for some reproof, for it is surely there, and he is unfortunate who does not hear it. We cannot touch a string or move a stop, but the charming moral transfixes us. Many an irksome noise, go a long way off, is heard as music, a proud sweet satire on the meanness of our lives we are conscious of an animal in us which awakens in proportion as our higher nature slumbers it is reptile and sensual and perhaps cannot be wholly expelled like the worms which even in life and health occupy our bodies possibly we may withdraw from it but never change its nature I fear that it may enjoy a certain health of its own, that we may be well, yet not pure. The other day I picked up the lower jaw of a hog with white and sound teeth and tusks, which suggested that there was an animal health and vigor distinct from the spiritual. This creature succeeded by other means than temperance and purity. That in which men differ from brute beasts, says Mencius, is a thing very inconsiderable. The common herd lose it very soon. Superior men preserve it carefully. Who knows what sort of life would result if we had attained to purity? If I knew so wise a man as could teach me purity, I would go to seek him forthwith. A command over our passions and over the external senses of the body and good acts are declared by the Ved to be indispensable in the mind's approximation to God. Yet the spirit can, for the time, pervade and control every member and function of the body, and transmute what in form is the grossest sensuality into purity and devotion. The generative energy, which, when we are loose, dissipates and makes us unclean, when we are continent, invigorates and inspires us. Chastity is the flowering of man, and what are called genius, heroism, holiness, and the like, are but various fruits which succeed it. 
man flows at once to God when the channel of purity is open. By turns our purity inspires and our purity casts us down. He is blessed who is assured that the animal is dying out in him day by day and the divine being established. Perhaps there is none but has cause for shame on account of the inferior and brutish nature to which he is allied. I fear that we are such gods or demigods only as fauns and satyrs, the divine allied to beasts, the creatures of appetite, and that, to some extent, our very life is our disgrace. How happy's he who hath due place assigned to his beasts, and disafforested his mind! Can use this horse, goat, wolf, and every beast, and is not ass himself to all the rest? Else man not only is the herd of swine, but he's those devils too which did incline them to a headlong rage and made them worse. All sensuality is one, though it takes many forms. All purity is one. It is the same whether a man eat or drink or cohabit or sleep sensually. They are but one appetite, and we only need to see a person do any one of these things to know how great a sensualist he is. The impure can neither stand nor sit with purity. When the reptile is attacked at one mouth of his burrow, he shows himself at another. If you would be chaste, you must be temperate. What is chastity? How shall a man know if he is chaste? He shall not know it. We have heard of this virtue, but we know not what it is. We speak conformably to the rumor which we have heard. From exertion come wisdom and purity, from sloth, ignorance, and sensuality. In the student, sensuality is a sluggish habit of mind. An unclean person is universally a slothful one, one who sits by a stove, whom the sun shines on, prostrate, who reposes without being fatigued. If you would avoid uncleanness and all the sins, work earnestly, though it be at cleaning a stable. Nature is hard to be overcome, but she must be overcome. What avails it that you are Christian if you are not purer than the heathen, if you deny yourself no more, if you are not more religious? I know of many systems of religion esteemed heathenish, whose precepts fill the reader with shame and provoke him to new endeavors, though it be to the performance of rites merely. I hesitate to say these things, but it is not because of the subject. I care not how obscene my words are, but because I cannot speak of them without betraying my impurity. We discourse freely without shame of one form of sensuality, and are silent about another. We are so degraded that we cannot speak simply of the necessary functions of human nature. In earlier ages, in some countries, every function was reverently spoken of and regulated by law. Nothing was too trivial for the Hindu lawgiver, however offensive it may be to modern taste. He teaches how to eat, drink, cohabit, void excrement and urine, and the like, elevating what is mean and does not falsely excuse himself by calling these things trifles. Every man is the builder of a temple, called his body, to the god he worships, after a style purely his own. Nor can he get off by hammering marble instead. We are all sculptors and painters, and our material is our own flesh and blood and bones. Any nobleness begins at once to refine a man's features any meanness or sensuality to embrute them. John Farmer sat at his door one September evening, after a hard day's work, his mind still running on his labor, more or less. Having bathed, he sat down to recreate his intellectual man. It was a rather cool evening, and some of his neighbors were apprehending a frost. He had not attended to the train of his thoughts long when he heard someone playing on a flute, and that sound harmonized with his mood. Still he thought of his work, but the burden of his thought was that, though this kept running in his head, and he found himself planning and contriving it against his will, yet it concerned him very little. 
it was no more than the scurf of his skin which was constantly shuffled off but the notes of the flute came home to his ears out of a different sphere from that he worked in and suggested work for certain faculties which slumbered in him they gently did away with the street and the village and the state in which he lived a voice said to him why do you stay here and live this mean moiling life when a glorious existence is possible for you those same stars twinkle over other fields than these but how to come out of this condition and actually migrate thither all that he could think of was to practice some new austerity to let his mind descend into his body and redeem it and treat himself with ever-increasing respect End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Walden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter Twelve Brute Neighbors. Sometimes I had a companion in my fishing who came through the village to my house from the other side of the town, and the catching of the dinner was as much a social exercise as the eating of it. Hermit, I wonder what the world is doing now. I have not heard so much as a locust over the sweet fern these three hours. The pigeons are all asleep upon their roosts. No flutter from them. Was that a farmer's noon horn which sounded from beyond the woods just now? The hands are coming in to boiled salt beef and cider and Indian bread. Why will men worry themselves so? He that does not eat need not work. I wonder how much they have reaped. Who would live there where a body can never think for the barking of bows? And, oh, the housekeeping, to keep bright the devil's doorknobs and scour his tubs this bright day. Better not keep a house, say, some hollow tree, and then for morning calls and dinner parties. Only a woodpecker tapping. Oh, they swarm. The sun is too warm there. They are born too far into life for me. I have water from the spring and a loaf of brown bread on the shelf. Hark! I hear a rustling of the leaves. Is it some ill-fed village hound yielding to the instinct of the chase, or the lost pig which is said to be in these woods, whose tracks I saw after the rain? It comes on apace. My sumacs and sweetbriars tremble. Eh, Mr. Poet, is it you? How do you like the world today? Poet see those clouds how they hang that's the greatest thing i've seen today there's nothing like it in old paintings nothing like it in foreign lands unless when we were off the coast of spain that's a true mediterranean sky i thought as i have my living to get and have not eaten today that i might go a-fishing that's the true industry for poets it is the only trade i have learned come let's along hermit I cannot resist. My brown bread will soon be gone. I will go with you gladly soon, but I am just concluding a serious meditation. I think that I am near the end of it. Leave me alone then for a while, but that we may not be delayed, you shall be digging the bait meanwhile. Angleworms are rarely to be met with in these parts, where the soil was never fattened with manure. The race is nearly extinct. The sport of digging the bait is nearly equal to that of catching the fish, when one's appetite is not too keen. And this you may have all to yourself today. I would advise you to set in the spade down yonder among the ground nuts where you see the John's wort waving. I think that I may warrant you one worm to every three sods you turn up, if you look well in amongst the roots of the grass, as if you were weeding. Or, if you choose to go farther, it would not be unwise, for I have found the increase of fair bait to be very nearly as the squares of the distances. Hermit, alone. Let me see, where was I? Methinks I was nearly in this frame of mind. The world lay about at this angle. Shall I go to heaven or a fishing? If I should soon bring this meditation to an end, would another so sweet occasion be likely to offer? 
I was as near being resolved into the essence of things as ever I was in my life. I fear my thoughts will not come back to me. If it would do any good, I would whistle for them. When they make us an offer, is it wise to say, we will think of it? My thoughts have left no track, and I cannot find the path again. What was it that I was thinking of? It was a very hazy day. I will just try these three sentences of Confuci. They may fetch that state about again. I know not whether it was the dumps or a budding ecstasy. Mem, there never is but one opportunity of a kind. Poet. How now, hermit? Is it too soon? I have just got thirteen whole ones, besides several, which are imperfect or undersized, but they will do for the smaller fry. They do not cover up the hook so much. Those village worms are quite too large. A shiner may make a meal of one without finding the skewer. Hermit. Well, then, let's be off. Shall we to the Concord? There's good sport there, if the water be not too high. Why do precisely these objects which we behold make a world? Why is man just these species of animals for his neighbors? As if nothing but a mouse could have filled this crevice? I suspect that Pilpay and company have put animals to their best use, for they are all beasts of burden in a sense, made to carry some portion of our thoughts. The mice which haunted my house were not the common ones, which are said to have been introduced into the country, but a wild native kind not found in the village. I sent one to a distinguished naturalist, and it interested him much. When I was building, one of these had its nest underneath the house, and before I had laid the second floor and swept out the shavings, would come out regularly at lunch time and pick up the crumbs at my feet. It probably had never seen a man before, and it soon became quite familiar, and would run over my shoes and up my clothes. It could readily ascend the sides of the room by short impulses, like a squirrel, which it resembled in its motions. At length, as I leaned with my elbow on the bench one day, it ran up my clothes and along my sleeve, and round and round the paper which held my dinner, while I kept the latter close, and dodged and played at bo-peep with it and when at last I held still a piece of cheese between my thumb and finger, it came and nibbled it, sitting in my hand, and afterward cleaned its face and paws, like a fly, and walked away. A Phoebe soon built in my shed, and a robin for protection in a pine which grew against the house. In June the partridge, Tetrao umbellus, which is so shy a bird, led her brood past my windows, from the woods in the rear to the front of my house, clucking and calling to them like a hen, and in all her behavior proving herself the hen of the woods. The young suddenly disperse on your approach at a signal from the mother, as if a whirlwind had swept them away, and they so exactly resemble the dried leaves and twigs that many a traveler has placed his foot in the midst of a brood and heard the whirr of the old bird as she flew off, and her anxious calls and mewing, or seen her trail her wings to attract his attention, without suspecting their neighborhood. The parent will sometimes roll and spin round before you in such a dishabille that you cannot, for a few moments, detect what kind of creature it is. The young, squat still and flat, often running their heads under a leaf, and mind only their mother's directions given from a distance, nor will your approach make them run again and betray themselves. You may even tread on them, or have your eyes on them for a minute without discovering them. I have held them in my open hand at such a time, and still their only care, obedient to their mother and their instinct, was to squat there without fear or trembling. So perfect is this instinct, that once, when I had laid them on the leaves again, and one accidentally fell on its side, it was found with the rest in exactly the same position, ten minutes afterward. They are not callow like the young of most birds, but more perfectly developed and precocious even than chickens. 
the remarkably adult yet innocent expression of their open and serene eyes is very memorable. All intelligence seems reflected in them. They suggest not merely the purity of infancy, but a wisdom clarified by experience. Such an eye was not born when the bird was, but is coeval with the sky it reflects. The woods do not yield another such a gem. The traveler does not often look into such a limpid well. The ignorant or reckless sportsman often shoots the parent at such a time, and leaves these innocents to fall a prey to some prowling beast or bird, or gradually mingle with the decaying leaves which they so much resemble. It is said that when hatched by a hen, they will directly disperse on some alarm, and so are lost, for they never hear the mother's call which gathers them again. These were my hens and chickens. It is remarkable how many creatures live wild and free, though secret in the woods, and still sustain themselves in the neighborhood of towns, suspected by hunters only. How retired the otter manages to live here. He grows to be four feet long, as big as a small boy perhaps without any human being getting a glimpse of him. I formerly saw the raccoon in the woods behind where my house is built, and probably still heard their wintering at night. Commonly I rested an hour or two in the shade at noon after planting, and ate my lunch and read a little by a spring which was the source of a swamp and of a brook, oozing from under Brister's Hill half a mile from my field. The approach to this was through a succession of descending grassy hollows, full of young pitch pines into a larger wood about the swamp there in a very secluded and shaded spot under a spreading white pine there was yet a clean firm sward to sit on i had dug out the spring and made a well of clear gray water where i could dip up a pailful without roiling it and thither i went for this purpose almost every day in midsummer when the pond was warmest Thither, too, the woodcock led her brood, to probe the mud for worms, flying but a foot above them down the bank, while they ran in a troop beneath. But at last, spying me, she would leave her young and circle round and round me, nearer and nearer, till within four or five feet, pretending broken wings and legs, to attract my attention and get off her young, who would already have taken up their march, with faint wiry peep, single file through the swamp as she directed or i heard the peep of the young when i could not see the parent bird there too the turtle dove sat over the spring or fluttered from bough to bough of the soft white pines over my head or the red squirrel coursing down the nearest bough was particularly familiar and inquisitive you only need sit still long enough in some attractive spot in the woods that all its inhabitants may exhibit themselves to you by turns. I was witness to events of a less peaceful character. One day when I went out to my woodpile, or rather my pile of stumps, I observed two large ants, the one red, the other much larger, nearly half an inch long, and black, fiercely contending with one another. Having once got hold, they never let go, but struggled and wrestled and rolled on the chips incessantly, Looking farther, I was surprised to find that the chips were covered with such combatants, that it was not a duellum, but a bellum, a war between two races of ants, the red always pitted against the black, and frequently two red ones to one black. The legions of these myrmidons covered all the hills and vales in my wood-yard, and the ground was already strewn with the dead and dying, both red and black. It was the only battle which I have ever witnessed the only battlefield I ever trod while the battle was raging. Internecine war, the red republicans on the one hand and the black imperialists on the other. On every side they were engaged in deadly combat, yet without any noise that I could hear, and human soldiers never fought so resolutely. I watched a couple that were fast locked in each other's embraces in a little sunny valley amid the chips, now at noonday prepared to fight till the sun went down, or life went out. The smaller red champion had fastened himself like a vice to his adversary's front, and through all the tumblings on that field never for an instant ceased to gnaw at one of his feelers near the root, 
having already caused the other to go by the board, while the stronger black one dashed him from side to side, and, as I saw on looking nearer, had already divested him of several of his members. They fought with more pernacity than bulldogs. Neither manifested the least disposition to retreat. It was evident that their battle cry was, Conquer or die. In the meanwhile, there came along a single red ant on the hillside of this valley, evidently full of excitement, who either had dispatched his foe or had not yet taken part in the battle, probably the latter, for he had lost none of his limbs, whose mother had charged him to return with his shield or upon it. Or, perchance, he was some Achilles who had nourished his wrath apart, and had now come to avenge or rescue his Patroclus. He saw this unequal combat from afar, for the blacks were nearly twice the size of the red. He drew near with rapid pace till he stood on his guard within half an inch of the combatants. Then, watching his opportunity, he sprang upon the black warrior and commenced his operations near the root of his right foreleg, leaving the foe to select among his own members. And so there were three united for life, as if a new kind of attraction had been invented, which put all other locks and cements to shame. I should not have wondered by this time to find that they had their respective musical bands stationed on some eminent ship and playing their national airs the while, to excite the slow and cheer the dying combatants. I was myself excited somewhat, even as if they had been men. The more you think of it, the less the difference, and certainly there is not the fight recorded in conquered history at least, if in the history of America, that will bear a moment's comparison with this, whether for the numbers engaged in it, or for the patriotism and heroism displayed. For numbers and for carnage it was an Austerlitz or Dresden. Conquered fight, two killed on the patriot side, and Luther Blanchard wounded. Why, here every ant was a buttrick. Fire, for God's sake, fire! And thousands shared the fate of Davis and Hosmer. There was not one hireling there. I have no doubt that it was a principle they fought for, as much as our ancestors, and not to avoid a threepenny tax on their tea. And the results of this battle will be as important and memorable to those whom it concerns as those of the Battle of Bunker Hill, at least. I took up the chip on which the three I have particularly described were struggling, carried it into my house, and placed it under a tumbler on my window sill in order to see the issue. Holding a microscope to the first mentioned red ant, I saw that, though he was assiduously gnawing at the near foreleg of his enemy, having severed his remaining feeler, his own breast was all torn away, exposing what vitals he had there to the jaws of the black warrior whose breastplate was apparently too thick for him to pierce, and the dark carbuncles of the sufferer's eyes shone with ferocity such as war only could excite. They struggled half an hour longer under the tumbler, and when I looked again the black soldier had severed the heads of his foes from their bodies, and the still living heads were hanging on either side of him like ghastly trophies at his saddle bow, and apparently as firmly fastened as ever and he was endeavoring with feeble struggles, being without feelers, and with only the remnant of a leg, and I know not how many other wounds, to divest himself of them, which at length, after half an hour more, he accomplished. I raised the glass, and he went off over the window sill in that crippled state. Whether he finally survived that combat, and spent the remainder of his days in some hotel des invalides, I do not know but I thought that his industry would not be worth much thereafter. I never learned which party was victorious, nor the cause of the war, but I felt for the rest of that day as if I had had my feelings excited and harrowed by witnessing the struggle, the ferocity and carnage of a human battle before my door. Kirby and Spence tell us that the battles of ants have long been celebrated, and the date of them recorded, though they say that Huber is the only modern author who appears to have witnessed them. Aeneas Silvius, say they, 
After giving a very circumstantial account of one contested with great obstinacy by a great and small species on the trunk of a pear tree, adds that "this action was fought in the pontificate of Eugenius the Fourth, in the presence of Nicholas Pistoriensis, an eminent lawyer, who related the whole history of the battle with the greatest fidelity." A similar engagement between great and small ants is recorded by Olaus Magnus, in which the small ones, being victorious, are said to have buried the bodies of their own soldiers, but left those of their giant enemies a prey to the birds. This event happened previous to the expulsion of the tyrant Christian II from Sweden. The battle which I witnessed took place in the presidency of Polk, five years before the passage of Webster's Fugitive Slave Bill. Many a village bows fit only to course a mud turtle in a victualling cellar, sported his heavy quarters in the woods without the knowledge of his master, and ineffectually smelled at old fox burrows and woodchuck holes, led perchance by some slight cur which nimbly threaded the wood and might still inspire a natural terror in its denizens. Now far behind his guide, barking like a canine bull toward some small squirrel which had treated itself for scrutiny, then, cantering off, bending the bushes with his weight, imagining that he is on the track of some stray member of the Jerbilla family. Once I was surprised to see a cat walking along the stony shore of the pond, for they rarely wander so far from home. The surprise was mutual. Nevertheless, the most domestic cat, which has lain on a rug all her days, appears quite at home in the woods, and, by her sly and stealthy behavior, proves herself more native there than the regular inhabitants. Once, when burying, I met with a cat with young kittens in the woods, quite wild, and they all, like their mother, had their backs up and were fiercely spitting at me. A few years before I lived in the woods, there was what was called a winged cat in one of the farmhouses in Lincoln, nearest the pond, Mr. Gillian Baker's. When I called to see her in June 1842, she was gone a-hunting in the woods, as was her wont. I am not sure whether it was a male or female, and so use the more common pronoun. But her mistress told me that she came into the neighborhood a little more than a year before, in April, and was finally taken into their house. That she was of a dark brownish-gray color, with a white spot on her throat and white feet, and had a large bushy tail, like a fox that in the winter the fur grew thick and flatted out along her sides, forming stripes ten or twelve inches long by two and a half wide, and under her chin like a muff, the upper side loose, the under matted like felt, and in the spring these appendages dropped off. They gave me a pair of her wings, which I keep still. There is no appearance of a membrane about them. Some thought it was part flying squirrel or some other animal which is not impossible, for, according to naturalists, prolific hybrids have been produced by the union of the marten and domestic cat. This would have been the right kind of cat for me to keep if I had kept any, for why should not a poet's cat be winged, as well as his horse? In the fall, the loon, Columbus glacialis, came, as usual, to molt and bathe in the pond, making the woods ring with his wild laughter before I had risen. At rumor of his arrival, all the mill-dam sportsmen are on the alert, in gigs and on foot, two by two, three by three, with patent rifles and conical balls and spy-glasses. They come rustling through the woods like autumn leaves, at least ten men to one loon. Some station themselves on this side of the pond, some on that, for the poor bird cannot be omnipresent. If he dive here, he must come up there. But now the kind October wind rises, rustling the leaves and rippling the surface of the water, so that no loon can be heard or seen, though his foes sweep the pond with spyglasses and make the woods resound with their discharges. The waves generously rise and dash angrily, taking sides with all waterfowl, and our sportsmen must beat a retreat to town and shop and unfinished jobs. But they were too often successful, 
When I went to get a pail of water early in the morning, I frequently saw this stately bird sailing out of my cove within a few rods. If I endeavored to overtake him in a boat, in order to see how he would maneuver, he would dive and be completely lost, so that I did not discover him again sometimes till the latter part of the day. But I was more than the match for him on the surface. He commonly went off in a rain. As I was paddling along the north shore one very calm October afternoon, for such days especially they settle on to the lakes, like the milkweed down, having looked in vain over the pond for a loon, suddenly one, sailing out from the shore toward the middle, a few rods in front of me, set up his wild laugh and betrayed himself. I pursued with a paddle, and he dived, but when he came up I was nearer than before. He dived again but I miscalculated the direction he would take, and we were fifty rods apart when he came to the surface this time, for I had helped to widen the interval. And again he laughed long and loud, and with more reason than before. He maneuvered so cunningly that I could not get within half a dozen rods of him. Each time, when he came to the surface, turning his head this way and that, he coolly surveyed the water and the land, and apparently chose his course so that he might come up where there was the widest expanse of water and at the greatest distance from the boat. It was surprising how quickly he made up his mind and put his resolve into execution. He led me at once to the widest part of the pond, and could not be driven from it. While he was thinking one thing in his brain, I was endeavoring to divine his thought in mine. It was a pretty game, played on the smooth surface of the pond, a man against a loon. Suddenly your adversary's checker disappears beneath the board, and the problem is to place yours nearest to where his will appear again. Sometimes he would come up unexpectedly on the opposite side of me, having apparently passed directly under the boat. So long-winded was he, and so unweariable, that when he had swum farthest he would immediately plunge again nevertheless, and then no wit could divine where, in the deep pond beneath the smooth surface, he might be speeding his way like a fish, for he had time and ability to visit the bottom of the pond in its deepest part. It is said that loons have been caught in the New York lakes eighty feet beneath the surface, with hooks set for trout though Walden is deeper than that. How surprised must the fishes be to see this ungainly visitor from another sphere speeding his way amid their schools! Yet he appeared to know his course as surely under water as on the surface, and swam much faster there. Once or twice I saw a ripple where he approached the surface, just put his head out to reconnoiter, and instantly dived again. I found that it was as well for me to rest on my oars and wait his reappearing as to endeavor to calculate where he would rise, for again and again when I was straining my eyes over the surface one way, I would suddenly be startled by his unearthly laugh behind me. But why, after displaying so much cunning, did he invariably betray himself the moment he came up by that loud laugh? Did not his white breast enough betray him? He was indeed a silly loon, I thought. I could commonly hear the splash of the water when he came up, and so also detected him. But after an hour he seemed as fresh as ever, dived as willingly, and swam yet farther than at first. It was surprising to see how serenely he sailed off with unruffled breast when he came to the surface, doing all the work with his webbed feet beneath. His usual note was his demonic laughter yet somewhat like that of a waterfowl. But occasionally when he had balked me most successfully and come up a long way off, he uttered a long-drawn unearthly howl, probably more like that of a wolf than any bird, as when a beast puts his muzzle to the ground and deliberately howls. This was his looning, perhaps the wildest sound that is ever heard here, making the woods ring far and wide. I concluded that he laughed in derision of my efforts, confident of his own resources. Though the sky was by this time overcast, the pond was so smooth that I could see where he broke the surface when I did not hear him. His white breast, the stillness of the air, and the smoothness of the water were all against him. 
At length, having come up fifty rods off, he uttered one of those prolonged howls, as if calling on the god of loons to aid him, and immediately there came a wind from the east and rippled the surface, and filled the whole air with misty rain, and I was impressed as if it were the prayer of the loon answered, and his god was angry with me, and so I left him disappearing far away on the tumultuous surface. For hours in fall days I watched the ducks cunningly tack and veer and hold the middle of the pond, far from the sportsmen, tricks which they will have less need to practice in Louisiana bayous. When compelled to rise, they would sometimes circle round and round and over the pond at a considerable height, from which they could easily see to other ponds and the river, like black motes in the sky, and when I thought they had gone off thither long since, they would settle down by a slanting flight of a quarter of a mile on to a distant part which was left free. But what besides safety they got by sailing in the middle of Walden, I do not know unless they love its water for the same reason that I do. End of chapter 12chapter 13 of Walden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 13 Housewarming. In October, I went a graping to the river meadows and loaded myself with clusters more precious for their beauty and fragrance than for food. There, too, I admired, though I did not gather, the cranberries small waxen gems, pendants of the meadow grass, pearly and red, which the farmer plucks with an ugly rake, leaving the smooth meadow in a snarl, heedlessly measuring them by the bushel and the dollar only, and sells the spoils of the meads to Boston and New York, destined to be jammed, to satisfy the tastes of lovers of nature there. So butchers rake the tongues of bison out of the prairie grass, regardless of the torn and drooping plant. The Barbary's brilliant fruit was likewise food for my eyes merely, but I collected a small store of wild apples for coddling, which the proprietor and travelers had overlooked. When chestnuts were ripe, I laid up half a bushel for winter. It was very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. They now sleep their long sleep under the railroad. With a bag on my shoulder, and a stick to open burrs with in my hand, for I did not always wait for the frost, amid the rustling of leaves and the loud reproofs of the red squirrels and the jays, whose half-consumed nuts I sometimes stole, for the burrs which they had selected were sure to contain sound ones. Occasionally I climbed and shook the trees. They grew also behind my house, and one large tree, which almost overshadowed it, was, when in flower, a bouquet which scented the whole neighborhood. But the squirrels and the jays got most of its fruit, the last coming in flocks early in the morning and picking the nuts out of the burrs before they fell. I relinquished these trees to them and visited the more distant woods composed wholly of chestnut. These nuts, as far as they went, were a good substitute for bread. Many other substitutes might perhaps be found. Digging one day for fish worms, I discovered the ground nut, Apios tuberosa, on its string, the potato of the aborigines, a sort of fabulous fruit which I had begun to doubt if I had ever dug and eaten in childhood, as I had told, and had not dreamed it. I had often since seen its crumpled red velvety blossom, supported by the stems of other plants, without knowing it to be the same. Cultivation has well nigh exterminated it. It has a Swedish taste, much like that of a frost-bitten potato, and I found it better boiled than roasted. This tuber seemed like a faint promise of nature to rear her own children and feed them simply here at some future period. In these days of fatted cattle in waving grain fields, this humble root, which was once the totem of an Indian tribe, is quite forgotten, or known only by its flowering vine. 
but let wild nature reign here once more and the tender and luxurious english grains will probably disappear before a myriad of foes and without the care of man the crow may carry back even the last seed of corn to the great cornfield of the indian's god in the southwest whence he has said to have brought it but the now almost exterminated ground nut will perhaps revive and flourish in spite of frosts and wildness prove itself indigenous and resume its ancient importance and dignity as the diet of the hunter tribe some indian ceres or minerva must have been the inventor and bestower of it and when the reign of poetry commences here its leaves and strings of nuts may be represented on our works of art already by the first of september i had seen two or three small maples turn scarlet across the pond beneath where the white stems of three aspens diverged at the point of a promontory next to the water how ah, many a tale their color told and gradually from week to week the character of each tree came out and it admired itself reflected in the smooth mirror of the lake each morning the manager of this gallery substituted some new picture distinguished by more brilliant or harmonious coloring for the old upon the walls the wasps came by thousands to my lodge in october as to winter quarters and settled on my windows within and on the walls overhead sometimes deterring visitors from entering each morning when they were numbed with cold i swept some of them out but i did not trouble myself much to get rid of them i even felt complimented by their regarding my house as a desirable shelter they never molested me seriously though they bedded with me and they gradually disappeared into what crevices i do not know avoiding winter and unspeakable cold like the wasps before i finally went into winter quarters in november i used to resort to the northeast side of walden which the sun reflected from the pitch-pine woods and the stony shore made the fireside of the pond it is so much pleasanter and wholesomer to be warmed by the sun while you can be than by an artificial fire i thus warmed myself by the still glowing embers which the summer like a departed hunter had left when i came to build my chimney i studied masonry my bricks being second-hand ones required to be cleaned with a trowel so that i learned more than usual of the qualities of bricks and trowels the mortar on them was fifty years old and was said to be still growing harder but this is one of those sayings which men love to repeat whether they are true or not such sayings themselves grow harder and adhere more firmly with age and it would take many blows with a trowel to clean an old wiseacre of them Many of the villages of Mesopotamia are built of second-hand bricks of a very good quality, obtained from the ruins of Babylon, and the cement on them is older and probably harder still. However that may be, I was struck by the peculiar toughness of the steel which bore so many violent blows without being worn out. As my bricks had been in a chimney before, though I did not read the name of Nebuchadnezzar on them, I picked out as many fireplace bricks as I could find to save work and waste, and I filled the spaces between the bricks about the fireplace with stones from the pond shore, and also made my mortar with the white sand from the same place. I lingered most about the fireplace, as the most vital part of the house. Indeed, I worked so deliberately that though I commenced at the ground in the morning, a course of bricks raised a few inches above the floor served for my pillow at night yet i did not get a stiff neck for it that i remember my stiff neck is of an older date i took a poet to board for a fortnight about those times which caused me to be put to it for room he brought his own knife though i had two and we used to scour them by thrusting them into the earth he shared with me the labors of cooking I was pleased to see my work rising so square and solid by degrees, and reflected that if it proceeded slowly it was calculated to endure a long time. The chimney is, to some extent, an independent structure, standing on the ground, 
and rising through the house to the heavens. Even after the house is burned, it still stands sometimes, and its importance and independence are apparent. This was toward the end of summer. It was now November. The north wind had already begun to cool the pond, though it took many weeks of steady blowing to accomplish it. It is so deep. When I began to have a fire at evening, before I plastered my house, the chimney carried smoke particularly well because of the numerous chinks between the boards. Yet I passed some cheerful evenings in that cool and airy apartment, surrounded by the rough brown boards full of knots and rafters with the bark on high overhead. My house never pleased my eye so much after it was plastered, though I was obliged to confess that it was more comfortable. Should not every apartment in which man dwells be lofty enough to create some obscurity overhead where flickering shadows may play at evening about the rafters? These forms are more agreeable to the fancy and imagination than fresco paintings or other the most expensive furniture. I now first began to inhabit my house, I may say, when I began to use it for warmth as well as shelter. I had got a couple of old fire dogs to keep the wood from the hearth, and it did me good to see the soot form on the back of the chimney which I had built, and I poked the fire with more right and more satisfaction than usual. My dwelling was small, and I could hardly entertain an echo in but it seemed larger for being a single apartment and remote from neighbors. All the attractions of a house were concentrated in one room. It was kitchen, chamber, parlor, and keeping room. And whatever satisfaction parent or child, master or servant, derived from living in a house, I enjoyed it all. Cato says, the master of a family, patrem familius, must have in his rustic villa Cellum oliarium, vinarium, dolia multa, ulti lubiat caritatem expertare, et rei, et virtuti, et gloriae erit, that is, an oil and wine cellar, many casks, so that it may be pleasant to expect hard times. It will be for his advantage, and virtue, and glory. I had in my cellar a firkin of potatoes, about two quarts of peas, with the weevil in them, and on my shelf a little rice, a jug of molasses, and of rye and Indian meal, a peck each. I sometimes dream of a larger and more populous house, standing in a golden age, of enduring materials and without gingerbread work, which shall still consist of only one room, a vast, rude, substantial, primitive hall, without ceiling or plastering, with bare rafters and purlins supporting a sort of lower heaven over one's head, useful to keep off rain and snow, where the king and queen posts stand out to receive your homage, when you have done reverence to the prostrate Saturn of an older dynasty on stepping over the sill. A cavernous house, wherein you must reach up a torch upon a pole to see the roof, where some may live in the fireplace, some in the recess of a window, and some on settles, some at one end of the hall, some at another, and some aloft on rafters with the spiders if they choose. A house which you have got into when you have opened the outside door, and the ceremony is over, where the weary traveller may wash and eat and converse and sleep without further journey such a shelter as you would be glad to reach in a tempestuous night, containing all the essentials of a house, and nothing for housekeeping, where you can see all the treasures of the house at one view, and everything hangs upon its peg that a man should use. At once kitchen, pantry, parlor, chamber, storehouse, and garret, where you can see so necessary a thing as a barrel or a ladder, so convenient a thing as a cupboard, and hear the pot boil, and pay your respects to the fire that cooks your dinner, and the oven that bakes your bread, and the necessary furniture and utensils are the chief ornaments, where the washing is not put out, nor the fire, nor the mistress, and perhaps you are sometimes requested to move from off the trap-door, when the cook would descend into the cellar, 
and so learn whether the ground is solid or hollow beneath you, without stamping. A house whose inside is as open and manifest as a bird's nest, and you cannot go in at the front door and out at the back without seeing some of its inhabitants, where to be a guest is to be presented with the freedom of the house, and not to be carefully excluded from seven-eighths of it, shut up in a particular cell, and told to make yourself at home there, in solitary confinement. Nowadays the host does not admit you to his hearth, but has got the mason to build one for yourself somewhere in his alley, and hospitality is the art of keeping you at the greatest distance. There is as much secrecy about the cooking as if he had a design to poison you. I am aware that I have been on many a man's premises, and might have been legally ordered off, but I am not aware that I have been in many men's houses. I might visit in my old clothes a king and queen, who live simply in such a house as I have described, if I were going their way. But backing out of a modern palace will be all that I shall desire to learn, if ever I am caught in one. It would seem as if the very language of our parlors would lose all its nerve and degenerate into palaver wholly. Our lives pass at such remoteness from its symbols, and its metaphors and tropes are necessarily so far-fetched, through slides and dumb-waiters, as it were. In other words, the parlor is so far from the kitchen and workshop. The dinner, even, is only the parable of a dinner commonly as if only the savage dwelt near enough to nature and truth to borrow a trope from them. How can their scholar, who dwells away in a northwest territory or the Isle of Man, tell what is parliamentary in the kitchen? However, only one or two of my guests were ever bold enough to stay and eat a hasty pudding with me. But when they saw that crisis approaching, they beat a hasty retreat, rather as if it would shake the house to its foundations. Nevertheless, it stood through a great many hasty puddings. I did not plaster till it was freezing weather. I brought over some whiter and cleaner sand for this purpose from the opposite shore of the pond in a boat, a sort of conveyance which would have tempted me to go much farther if necessary. My house had, in the meanwhile, been shingled down to the ground on every side. In lathing, I was pleased to be able to send home each nail with a single blow of the hammer, and it was my ambition to transfer the plaster from the board to the wall neatly and rapidly. I remember the story of a conceited fellow, who, in fine clothes, was wont to lounge about the village once, giving advice to workmen. Venturing one day to substitute deeds for words, he turned up his cuffs, seized a plasterer's board, and having loaded his trowel without mishap, with a complacent look toward the lathing overhead, made a bold gesture thitherward, and straightway, to his complete discomfiture, received the whole contents in his ruffled bosom. I admired anew the economy and convenience of plastering, which so effectually shuts out the cold and takes a handsome finish, and I learned the various casualties to which the plasterer is liable. I was surprised to see how thirsty the bricks were, which drank up all the moisture in my plaster before I had smoothed it, and how many pailfuls of water it takes to christen a new hearth. I had the previous winter made a small quantity of lime by burning the shells of the Unio Fluviatilis, which our river affords, for the sake of the experiment, so that I knew where my materials came from. I might have got good limestone within a mile or two and burned it myself, if I had cared to do so. The pond had, in the meanwhile, skimmed over in the shadiest and shallowest coves, some days or even weeks before the general freezing. The first ice is especially interesting and perfect, being hard, dark, and transparent, and affords the best opportunity that ever offers for examining the bottom where it is shallow for you can lie at your length on ice only an inch thick like a skater insect on the surface of the water and study the bottom at your leisure only two or three inches distant like a picture behind a glass and the water is necessarily always smooth then 
There are many furrows in the sand where some creature has travelled about and doubled on its tracks, and for wrecks it is strewn with the cases of caddis worms made of minute grains of white quartz. Perhaps these have creased it, for you find some of their cases in the furrows, though they are deep and broad for them to make. But the ice itself is the object of most interest, though you must improve the earliest opportunity to study it. If you examine it closely the morning after it freezes, you find that the greater part of the bubbles which at first appeared to be within it are against its under surface, and that more are continually rising from the bottom, while the ice is as yet comparatively solid and dark, that is, you can see the water through it. These bubbles are from an eightieth to an eighth of an inch in diameter, very clear and beautiful and you see your face reflected in them through the ice. There may be thirty or forty of them to a square inch. There are also, already within the ice, narrow oblong perpendicular bubbles about half an inch long, sharp cones with the apex upward, or oftener, if the ice is quite fresh, minute spherical bubbles one directly above another, like a string of beads but these within the ice are not so numerous nor obvious as those beneath. I sometimes used to cast on stones to try the strength of the ice, and those which broke through carried in air with them, which formed very large and conspicuous white bubbles beneath. One day, when I came to the same place, forty-eight hours afterward, I found that those large bubbles were still perfect, though an inch more of ice had formed as I could see distinctly by the seam in the edge of a cake. But as the last two days had been very warm, like an Indian summer, the ice was not now transparent, showing the dark green color of the water and the bottom, but opaque and whitish or gray, and though twice as thick was hardly stronger than before, for the air bubbles had greatly expanded under this heat and run together and lost their regularity. They were no longer one directly over another, but often like silvery coins poured from a bag, one overlapping another, or in thin flakes, as if occupying slight cleavages. The beauty of the ice was gone, and it was too late to study the bottom. Being curious to know what position my great bubbles occupied with regard to the new ice, I broke out a cake containing a middling-sized one, and turned it bottom upward. The new ice had formed around and under the bubble so that it was included between the two ices. It was wholly in the lower ice, but close against the upper, and was flattish, or perhaps slightly lenticular, with a rounded edge a quarter of an inch deep by four inches in diameter, and I was surprised to find that directly under the bubble the ice was melted with great regularity in the form of a saucer reversed to the height of five-eighths of an inch in the middle, leaving a thin partition there between the water and the bubble, hardly an eighth of an inch thick, and in many places the small bubbles in this partition had burst out downward, and probably there was no ice at all under the largest bubbles, which were a foot in diameter. I inferred that the infinite number of minute bubbles which I had first seen against the under surface of the ice were now frozen in likewise and that each, in its degree, has operated like a burning glass on the ice beneath to melt and rot it. These are the little air guns which contribute to make the ice crack and whoop. At length the winter set in good earnest, just as I had finished plastering, and the wind began to howl around the house as if it had not had permission to do so till then. Night after night the geese came lumbering in the dark, with a clangor and a whistling of wings, even after the ground was covered with snow, some to alight in Walden, and some flying low over the woods toward Fairhaven, bound for Mexico. Several times, when returning from the village at ten or eleven o'clock at night, I heard the tread of a flock of geese, or else ducks, on the dry leaves in the woods by a pond hole behind my dwelling, where they had come up to feed, and the faint honk or quack of their leader as they hurried off. In 1845 Walden froze entirely over for the first time on the night of the 22nd of December, 
flints and other shallower ponds, and the river having been frozen ten days or more. In forty-six, the sixteenth, in forty-nine, about the thirty-first, and in fifty, about the twenty-seventh of December, in fifty-two, the fifth of January, in fifty-three, the thirty-first of December. The snow had already covered the ground since the twenty-fifth of November, and surrounded me suddenly with the scenery of winter. I withdrew yet farther into my shell, and endeavored to keep a bright fire both within my house and within my breast. My employment out of doors now was to collect the dead wood in the forest, bringing it in my hands or on my shoulders, or sometimes trailing a dead pine tree under each arm to my shed. An old forest fence which had seen its best days was a great haul for me. I sacrificed it to Vulcan, for it was past serving the god Terminus. How much more interesting an event is that man's supper, who has just been forth in the snow, to hunt, nay, you might say steal, the fuel to cook it with. His bread and meat are sweet. There are enough faggots and waste wood of all kinds in the forest, of most of our towns, to support many fires, but which at present warm none, and some think, hinder the growth of the young wood. There was also the driftwood of the pond. In the course of the summer I had discovered a raft of pitch-pine logs with the bark on, pinned together by the Irish when the railroad was built. This I hauled up partly on the shore. After soaking two years, and then lying high six months, it was perfectly sound, though water-logged past drying. I amused myself one winter day with sliding this piecemeal across the pond, nearly half a mile, skating behind with one end of the log fifteen feet long on my shoulder and the other on the ice, or I tied several logs together with a birch withy, and then with a longer birch or alder which had a hook at the end, dragged them across. Though completely waterlogged and almost as heavy as lead, they not only burned long, but made a very hot fire. Nay, I thought that they burned better for the soaking, as if the pitch being confined by the water burned longer, as in a lamp. Gilpin, in his account of the forest borderers of England, says that the encroachments of trespassers and the houses and fences thus raised on the borders of the forest were considered as great nuisances by the old forest law, and were severely punished under the name perprestures, as tending ad terrarum ferrarum, ad nocumentum horstae, etc., to the frightening of the game and detriment of the forest. But I was interested in the preservation of the venison and the vert more than the hunters or woodchoppers, and as much as though I had been the Lord Warden himself. And if any part was burned, though I burned it myself by accident, I grieved with a grief that lasted longer, and was more inconsolable than that of the proprietors. Nay, I grieved when it was cut down by the proprietors themselves. I would that our farmers, when they cut down a forest, felt some of that awe which the old Romans did when they came to thin or let in the light to a consecrated grove, lusum conculare, that is, would believe that it is sacred to some god. The Roman made an expiatory offering, and prayed, Whatever god or goddess thou art to whom this grove is sacred, be propitious to me, my family, and children, etc. It is remarkable what a value is still put upon wood even in this age and in this new country, a value more permanent and universal than that of gold. After all our discoveries and inventions, no man will go by a pile of wood. It is as precious to us as it was to our Saxon and Norman ancestors. If they made their bows of it, we make our gun stocks of it. Michaud, more than thirty years ago, says that the price of wood for fuel in new york and philadelphia nearly equals and sometimes exceeds that of the best wood in paris though this immense capital annually requires more than three hundred thousand cords and is surrounded to the distance of three hundred miles by cultivated plains 
In this town the price of wood rises almost steadily, and the only question is how much higher it is to be this year than it was the last. Mechanics and tradesmen who come in person to the forest on no other errand are sure to attend the wood auction, and even pay a high price for the privilege of gleaning after the woodchopper. It is now many years that men have resorted to the forest for fuel and the materials of the arts, the New Englander and the New Hollander, the Parisian and the Celt, the farmer and Robin Hood, Goody Blake and Harry Gill. In most parts of the world, the prince and the peasant, the scholar and the savage, equally require still a few sticks from the forest to warm them and cook their food. Neither could I do without them. Every man looks at his woodpile with a kind of affection. I love to have mine before my window, and the more chips the better to remind me of my pleasing work. I had an old axe which nobody claimed, with which by spells in winter days on the sunny side of the house I played about the stumps which I had got out of my bean field. As my driver prophesied when I was plowing, they warmed me twice, once while I was splitting them, and again when they were on the fire, so that no fuel could give out more heat. As for the axe, I was advised to get the village blacksmith to jump it, but I jumped him, and, putting a hickory helf from the woods into it, made it do. If it was dull, it was at least hung true. A few pieces of fat pine were a great treasure. It is interesting to remember how much of this food for fire is still concealed in the bowels of the earth. In previous years I had often gone prospecting over some bare hillside where a pitch pine wood had formerly stood and got out the fat pine roots. They are almost indestructible. Stumps thirty or forty years old at least will still be sound at the core, though the sapwood has all become vegetable mold as appears by the scales of the thick bark forming a ring level with the earth four or five inches distant from the heart. With axe and shovel you explore this mine, and follow the marrowy store, yellow as beef tallow, or, as if you had struck on a vein of gold, deep into the earth. But commonly I kindled my fire with the dry leaves of the forest which I had stored up in my shed before the snow came. Green hickory, finely split, makes the woodchopper's kindlings when he has a camp in the woods. Once in a while I got a little of this. When the villagers were lighting their fires beyond the horizon, I too gave notice to the various wild inhabitants of Walden Vale, by a smoky streamer from my chimney, that I was awake. Light-winged smoke, Icarian bird, melting thy pinions in thy upward flight. Lark without song and messenger of dawn, circling above the hamlets as thy nest. Or else, departing dream and shadowy form of midnight vision, gathering up thy skirts, by night star-veiling and by day darkening the light and blotting out the sun. Go thou, my incense, upward from this hearth, and ask the gods to pardon this clear flame. Hard green wood just cut, though I used but little of that, answered my purpose better than any other. I sometimes left a good fire when I went to take a walk in a winter afternoon, and when I returned three or four hours afterward it would still be alive and glowing. My house was not empty, though I was gone. It was as if I had left a cheerful housekeeper behind. It was I and fire that lived there and commonly my housekeeper proved trustworthy. One day, however, as I was splitting wood, I thought that I would just look in at the window and see if the house was not on fire. It was the only time I remember to have been particularly anxious on this score. So I looked and saw that a spark had caught my bed, and I went in and extinguished it when it had burned a place as big as my hand but my house occupied so sunny and sheltered a position, and its roof was so low, that I could afford to let the fire go out in the middle of almost any winter day. The moles nested in my cellar, nibbling every third potato, and making a snug bed even there, of some hair left after plastering and of brown paper, 
for even the wildest animals love comfort and warmth as well as man, and they survive the winter only because they are so careful to secure them. Some of my friends spoke as if I was coming to the woods on purpose to freeze myself. The animal merely makes a bed, which he warms with his body, in a sheltered place. But man, having discovered fire, boxes up some air in a spacious apartment, and warms that, instead of robbing himself, makes that his bed, in which he can move about divested of more cumbrous clothing, maintain a kind of summer in the midst of winter, and, by means of windows, even admit the light, and with a lamp lengthen out the day. Thus he goes a step or two beyond instinct, and saves a little time for the fine arts. Though, when I had been exposed to the rudest blasts a long time, my whole body began to grow torpid, when I reached the genial atmosphere of my house I soon recovered my faculties and prolonged my life. But the most luxuriously housed has little to boast of in this respect nor need we trouble ourselves to speculate how the human race may be at last destroyed. It would be easy to cut their threads any time with a little sharper blast from the north. We go on dating from cold Fridays and great snows, but a little colder Friday or greater snow would put a period to man's existence on the globe. The next winter I used a small cooking stove for economy, since I did not own the forest, but it did not keep fire so well as the open fireplace. Cooking was then, for the most part, no longer a poetic, but merely a chemic process. It will soon be forgotten, in these days of stoves, that we used to roast potatoes in the ashes after the Indian fashion. The stove not only took up room and scented the house, but it concealed the fire, and I felt as if I had lost a companion. You can always see a face in the fire. The laborer, looking into it at evening, purifies his thoughts of the dross and earthiness which they have accumulated during the day. But I could no longer sit and look into the fire, and the pertinent words of a poet recurred to me with new force. Never, bright flame, may be denied to me, thy dear life-imaging, close sympathy. What but my hopes shot upward ere so bright? What but my fortunes sunk so low in night? Why art thou banished from our hearth and hall, thou who art welcomed and beloved by all? Was thy existence then too fanciful, for our life's common light, who are so dull? Did thy bright gleam mysterious converse hold, with our congenial souls, secrets too bold? Well, we are safe and strong, for now we sit Beside a hearth where no dim shadows flit, Where nothing cheers nor saddens but a fire, Warm feet and hands, nor does to more aspire. By whose compact utilitarian heap The present may sit down and go to sleep nor fear the ghosts who from the dim past walked, and with us by the unequal light of the old wood fire talked. End of chapter 13this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 14 Former Inhabitants and Winter Visitors I weathered some merry snowstorms, and spent some cheerful winter evenings by my fireside while the snow whirled wildly without, and even the hooting of the owl was hushed. For many weeks I met no one in my walks but those who came occasionally to cut wood and sled it to the village. The elements, however, abetted me in making a path through the deepest snow in the woods, for when I had once gone through, the wind blew the oak leaves into my tracks where they lodged, and by absorbing the rays of the sun melted the snow, and so not only made a bed for my feet, 
but in the night their dark line was my guide. For human society I was obliged to conjure up the former occupants of these woods. Within the memory of many of my townsmen, the road near which my house stands resounded with the laugh and gossip of inhabitants, and the woods which border it were notched and dotted here and there with their little gardens and dwellings though it was then much more shut in by the forest than now. In some places, within my own remembrance, the pines would scrape both sides of a chaise at once, and women and children who were compelled to go this way to Lincoln alone and on foot did it with fear and often ran a good part of the distance. Though mainly but a humble route to neighboring villages or for the woodsman's team, it once amused the traveller more than now by its variety, and lingered longer in his memory. Where now firm open fields stretch from the village to the woods, it then ran through a maple swamp on a foundation of logs, the remnants of which doubtless still underlie the present dusty highway from the Stratton, now the almshouse farm, to Brister's Hill. East of my bean field, across the road, lived Cato Ingram, slave of Duncan Ingram, Esquire, gentleman of Concord Village, who built his slave a house and gave him permission to live in Walden Woods. Cato, not Udicensis, but Concordiensis. Some say that he was a Guinea Negro. There are a few who remember his little patch among the walnuts, which he let grow up till he should be old and need them but a younger and whiter speculator got them at last. He too, however, occupies an equally narrow house at present. Cato's half-obliterated cellar hole still remains, though known to few, being concealed from the traveller by a fringe of pines. It is now filled with the smooth sumac, rus glabra, and one of the earliest species of goldenrod, solidago stricta, grows there luxuriantly. Here, by the very corner of my field, still nearer to town, Zilpha, a colored woman, had her little house, where she spun linen for the townsfolk, making the Walden woods ring with her shrill singing, for she had a loud and notable voice. At length, in the War of 1812, her dwelling was set on fire by English soldiers, prisoners on parole, when she was away, and her cat and dog and hens were all burned up together. She led a hard life, and somewhat inhumane. One old frequenter of these woods remembers that as he passed her house one noon, he heard her muttering to herself over her gurgling pot, "'Ye're all bones! Bones!' I have seen bricks amid the oak copse there. Down the road on the right hand, on Brister's Hill, lived Brister Freeman, a handy negro, slave of Squire Cummings once. There, where grow still the apple trees which Brister planted and tended, large old trees now, but their fruit still wild and ciderish to my taste. Not long since I read his epitaph in the old Lincoln burying ground, a little on one side near the unmarked graves of some British grenadiers who fell in the retreat from Concord, where he is styled Scipio Brister, Scipio Africanus, he had some title to be called a man of color, as if he were discolored. It also told me, with staring emphasis, when he died, which was but an indirect way of informing me that he ever lived. With him dwelt Fenda, his hospitable wife, who told fortunes, yet pleasantly, large, round, and black, blacker than any of the children of night, such a dusky orb as never rose on Concord before or since. Farther down the hill on the left, on the old road in the woods, are marks of some homestead of the Stratton family, whose orchard once covered all the slope of Brister's Hill, but was long since killed out by pitch pines, excepting a few stumps whose old roots furnish still the wild stocks of many a thrifty village tree. Nearer yet to town you come to Breed's location, on the other side of the way, just on the edge of the wood ground famous for the pranks of a demon not distinctly named in old mythology, 
who has acted a prominent and astounding part in our New England life, and deserves as much as any mythological character to have his biography written one day, who first comes in the guise of a friend or hired man, and then robs and murders the whole family. New England rum. But history must not yet tell the tragedies enacted here. Let time intervene in some measure to assuage and lend an azure tint to them. Here the most indistinct and dubious tradition says that once a tavern stood, the well the same, which tempered the traveller's beverage and refreshed his steed. Here then men saluted one another, and heard and told the news, and went their ways again. Breed's hut was standing only a dozen years ago, though it had long been unoccupied. It was about the size of mine. It was set on fire by mischievous boys one election night, if I do not mistake. I lived on the edge of the village then, and had just lost myself over Davenant's Gondibert, that winter that I labored with a lethargy, which, by the way, I never knew whether to regard as a family complaint, having an uncle who goes to sleep shaving himself, and is obliged to sprout potatoes in the cellar Sundays in order to keep awake and keep the Sabbath, or as a consequence of my attempt to read Chalmers' collection of English poetry without skipping. It fairly overcame my nervy. I had just sunk my head on this when the bells rung fire, and in hot haste the engines rolled that way, led by a straggling troop of men and boys, and I among the foremost, for I had leaped the brook. We thought it was far south over the woods, we who had run to fires before, barn, shop, or dwelling-house, or all together. "'It's Baker's Barn,' cried one. "'It is the Codman Place,' affirmed another. And then fresh sparks went up above the wood, as if the roof fell in, and we all shouted, "'Conquered to the rescue!' Wagons shot past with furious speed and crushing loads, bearing, perchance, among the rest, the agent of the insurance company, who was bound to go however far, and ever and anon the engine bell tinkled behind, more slow and sure, and, rearmost of all, as it was afterward whispered, came they who set the fire and gave the alarm. Thus we kept on like true idealists, rejecting the evidence of our senses, until at a turn in the road we heard the crackling and actually felt the heat of the fire from over the wall, and realized, alas, that we were there. The very nearness of the fire but cooled our ardor. At first we thought to throw a frog-pond on to it, but concluded to let it burn, it was so far gone and so worthless. So we stood round our engine, jostled one another, expressed our sentiments through speaking trumpets, or in lower tone referred to the great conflagrations which the world has witnessed, including Bascom's shop, and between ourselves we thought that were we there in season with our tub and a full frog-pond by, we could turn that threatened last and universal one into another flood. We finally retreated without doing any mischief, returned to sleep and Gondibert. But, as for Gondibert, I would accept that passage in the preface about wit being the soul's powder. But most of mankind are strangers to wit, as Indians are to powder. It chanced that I walked that way across the fields the following night, about the same hour, and hearing a low moaning at this spot, I drew near in the dark, and discovered the only survivor of the family that I know, the heir of both its virtues and its vices, who alone was interested in this burning, lying on his stomach and looking over the cellar wall at the still smouldering cinders beneath, muttering to himself as is his wont. He had been working far off in the river meadows all day, and had improved the first moments that he could call his own to visit the home of his fathers and his youth. He gazed into the cellar from all sides and points of view by turns, always lying down to it as if there was some treasure which he remembered, concealed between the stones, where there was absolutely nothing but a heap of bricks and ashes. The house being gone, he looked at what there was left. 
he was soothed by the sympathy which my mere presence implied, and showed me as well as the darkness permitted where the well was covered up, which, thank heaven, could never be burned, and he groped long about the wall to find the well sweep which his father had cut and mounted, feeling for the iron hook or staple by which a burden had been fastened to the heavy end, all that he could now cling to, to convince me that it was no common rider. I felt it, and still remark it almost daily in my walks, for by it hangs the history of a family. Once more, on the left, where are seen the well and lilac bushes by the wall, in the now open field, lived Nutting and Le Grosse. But to return toward Lincoln. Farther in the woods than any of these, where the road approaches nearest to the pond, Wyman the potter squatted, and furnished his townsmen with earthenware, and left the sentence to succeed him. Neither were they rich in worldly goods, holding the land by sufferance while they lived, and there often the sheriff came in vain to collect the taxes, and attached a chip for form's sake, as I have read in his accounts, there being nothing else that he could lay his hands on. One day in midsummer, when I was hoeing, a man who was carrying a load of pottery to market stopped his horse against my field, and inquired concerning Wyman the younger. He had long ago bought a potter's wheel of him, and wished to know what had become of him. I had read of the potter's clay and wheel in scripture, but it had never occurred to me that the pots we use were not such as had come down unbroken from those days, or grown on trees like gourds somewhere and I was pleased to hear that so fictile an art was ever practiced in my neighborhood. The last inhabitant of these woods before me was an Irishman, Hugh Coyle, if I have spelt his name with Coyle enough, who occupied Wyman's tenement. Colonel Coyle, he was called. Rumor said that he had been a soldier at Waterloo. If he had lived, I should have made him fight his battles over again. His trade here was that of a ditcher. Napoleon went to St. Helena, Coyle came to Walden Woods. All I know of him is tragic. He was a man of manners, like one who has seen the world, and was capable of more civil speech than you could well attend to. He wore a greatcoat in midsummer, being affected with the trembling delirium, and his face was the color of carmine. He died in the road at the foot of Brister's Hill shortly after I came to the woods, so that I have not remembered him as a neighbor. Before his house was pulled down, when his comrades avoided it as an unlucky castle, I visited it. There lay his old clothes, curled up by use, as if they were himself, upon his raised plank bed. His pipe lay broken on the hearth, instead of a bowl broken at the fountain. The last could never have been the symbol of his death, for he confessed to me that, though he had heard of Brister Spring, he had never seen it. And soiled cards, king of diamonds, spades and hearts, were scattered over the floor. One black chicken which the administrator could not catch, black as night and as silent, not even croaking, awaiting Reynard, still went to roost in the next apartment. In the rear there was the dim outline of a garden, which had been planted, but had never received its first hoeing, owing to those terrible shaking fits, though it was now harvest time. It was overrun with Roman wormwood and beggar ticks, which last stuck to my clothes for all fruit. The skin of a woodchuck was freshly stretched upon the back of the house, a trophy of his last waterloo, but no warm cap or mittens would he want more. Now only a dent in the earth marks the site of these dwellings, with buried cellar stones, and strawberries, raspberries, thimbleberries, hazel bushes, and sumacs growing in the sunny sward there. Some pitch pine or gnarled oak occupies what was the chimney nook, and a sweet scented black birch, perhaps, waves where the door stone was. Sometimes the well dent is visible, where once a spring oozed now dry and tearless grass, or it was covered deep, not to be discovered till some late day, with a flat stone under the sod when the last of the race departed. What a sorrowful act must that be, 
the covering up of wells, coincident with the opening of wells of tears. These cellar dents, like deserted fox burrows, old holes, are all that is left where once were the stir and bustle of human life, and fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, in some form in dialect or other, were by turns discussed. But all I can learn of their conclusions amounts to just this, that Cato and Brister pulled wool, which is about as edifying as the history of more famous schools of philosophy. Still grows the vivacious lilac a generation after the door and lintel and the sill are gone unfolding its sweet-scented flowers each spring to be plucked by the musing traveller, planted and tended once by children's hands in front-yard plots, now standing by wall-sides in retired pastures and giving place to new rising forests. The last of that stirp sole survivor of that family. Little did the dusky children think that the puny slip with its two eyes only which they stuck in the ground in the shadow of the house and daily watered, would root itself so and outlive them, and house itself in the rear that shaded it, and grown man's garden and orchard, and tell their story faintly to the lone wanderer, a half-century after they had grown up and died, blossoming as fair and smelling as sweet as in that first spring. I mark its still tender, civil, cheerful lilac colors. But this small village, germ of something more, why did it fail while Concord keeps its ground? Were there no natural advantages, no water privileges, forsooth? I, the deep Walden Pond and cool Brister Spring, privileged to drink long and healthy draughts at these, all unimproved by these men but to dilute their glass. They were universally a thirsty race. Might not the basket, stable broom, mat-making, corn-parching, linen-spinning, and pottery business have thrived here, making the wilderness to blossom like the rose, and a numerous posterity have inherited the land of their fathers? The sterile soil would, at least, have been proof against a lowland degeneracy. Alas, how little does the memory of these human inhabitants enhance the beauty of the landscape! Again, perhaps, Nature will try, with me for a first settler, and my house raised last spring to be the oldest in the hamlet. I am not aware that any man has ever built on the spot which I occupy. Deliver me from a city built on the site of a more ancient city, whose materials are ruins, whose gardens cemeteries. The soil is blanched and accursed there, and before that becomes necessary the earth itself will be destroyed. With such reminiscences I repeopled the woods and lulled myself asleep. At this season I seldom had a visitor. When the snow lay deepest, no wanderer ventured near my house for a week or fortnight at a time, but there I lived as snug as a meadow mouse, or as cattle and poultry which are said to have survived for a long time, buried in drifts, even without food or like that early settler's family in the town of Sutton, in this state, whose cottage was completely covered by the great snow of 1717 when he was absent, and an Indian found it only by the hole which the chimney's breath made in the drift, and so relieved the family. But no friendly Indian concerned himself about me, nor needed he, for the master of the house was at home. The great snow, how cheerful it is to hear of! when the farmers could not get to the woods and swamps with their teams, and were obliged to cut down the shade trees before their houses, and when the crust was harder cut off the trees in the swamps ten feet from the ground, as it appeared the next spring. In the deepest snows the path which I used from the highway to my house, about half a mile long, might have been represented by a meandering dotted line with wide intervals between the dots. For a week of even weather I took exactly the same number of steps, and of the same length coming and going, stepping deliberately and with the precision of a pair of dividers in my own deep tracks. To such routine the winter reduces us, yet often they were filled with heaven's own blue. 
but no weather interfered fatally with my walks, or rather my going abroad, for I frequently tramped eight or ten miles through the deepest snow to keep an appointment with a beech tree or a yellow birch or an old acquaintance among the pines. When the ice and snow, causing their limbs to droop and so sharpening their tops, had changed the pines into fir trees, wading to the tops of the highest hills when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level, and shaking down another snowstorm on my head at every step, or sometimes creeping and floundering thither on my hands and knees when the hunters had gone into winter quarters. One afternoon I amused myself by watching a barred owl, Strix nebulosa, sitting on one of the lower dead limbs of a white pine close to the trunk in broad daylight, I standing within a rod of him. He could hear me when I moved and crotched the snow with my feet, but could not plainly see me. When I made most noise he would stretch out his neck and erect his neck feathers and open his eyes wide, but their lids soon fell again and he began to nod. I too felt a slumberous influence after watching him half an hour, as he sat thus with his eyes half open like a cat, winged brother of the cat. There was only a narrow slit left between their lids, by which he preserved a peninsular relation to me. Thus, with half-shut eyes, looking out from the land of dreams and endeavoring to realize me, vague object or mote that interrupted his visions. At length, on some louder noise or my nearer approach, he would grow uneasy and sluggishly turn about on his perch, as if impatient at having his dreams disturbed, and when he launched himself off and flapped through the pines, spreading his wings to unexpected breath, I could not hear the slightest sound from them. Thus, guided amid the pine boughs rather by a delicate sense of their neighborhood than by sight, feeling his twilight way, as it were, with his sensitive pinions, he found a new perch where he might in peace await the dawning of his day. As I walked over the long causeway made for the railroad through the meadows, I encountered many a blustering and nipping wind, for nowhere has it freer play, and when the frost had smitten me on one cheek, heathen as I was, I turned to it the other also nor was it much better by the carriage road from Brister's Hill. For I came to town still, like a friendly Indian, when the contents of the broad open fields were all piled up between the walls of the Walden Road, and half an hour sufficed to obliterate the tracks of the last traveller. And when I returned, new drifts would have formed through which I floundered, where the busy northwest wind had been depositing the powdery snow round a sharp angle in the road, and not a rabbit's track, nor even the fine print, the small type, of a meadow mouse was to be seen. Yet I rarely failed to find, even in midwinter, some warm and springly swamp where the grass and the skunk cabbage still put forth with perennial verdure and some hardier bird occasionally awaited the return of spring. Sometimes, notwithstanding the snow, when I returned from my walk at evening, I crossed the deep tracks of a woodchopper leading from my door, and found his pile of whittlings on the hearth, and my house filled with the odor of his pipe. Or on a Sunday afternoon, if I chanced to be at home, I heard the crunching of the snow made by the step of a long-headed farmer, who from far through the woods sought my house to have a social crack. One of the few of his vocation, who are men on their farms, who donned a frock instead of a professor's gown, and is as ready to extract the moral out of church or state as to haul a load of manure from his barnyard. We talked of rude and simple times when men sat about large fires in cold bracing weather with clear heads and when other dessert failed we tried our teeth on many a nut which wise squirrels have long since abandoned for those which have the thickest shells are commonly empty the one who came from farthest to my lodge through deepest snows and most dismal tempests was a poet a farmer a hunter a soldier a reporter 
Even a philosopher may be daunted, but nothing can deter a poet, for he is actuated by pure love. Who can predict his comings and goings? His business calls him out at all hours, even when doctors sleep. We made that small house ring with boisterous mirth and resound with the murmur of much sober talk, making amends then to Walden Vale for the long silences. Broadway was still and deserted in comparison. At suitable intervals there were regular salutes of laughter, which might have been referred indifferently to the last uttered or the forthcoming jest. We made many a brand new theory of life over a thin dish of gruel, which combined the advantages of conviviality with the clear-headedness which philosophy requires. I should not forget that during my last winter at the pond there was another welcome visitor, who at one time came through the village through snow and rain and darkness, till he saw my lamp through the trees and shared with me some long winter evenings. One of the last of the philosophers, Connecticut gave him to the world. He peddled first her wares, afterwards, as he declares, his brains. These he peddles still prompting God and disgracing man, bearing for fruit his brain only, like the nut its kernel. I think that he must be the man of the most faith of any alive. His words and attitude always suppose a better state of things than other men are acquainted with, and he will be the last man to be disappointed as the ages revolve. He has no venture in the present but though comparatively disregarded now when his day comes laws unsuspected by most will take effect and masters of families and rulers will come to him for advice how blind that cannot see serenity a true friend of man almost the only friend of human progress an old mortality to say rather an immortality with unwearied patience and faith making plain the image engraven in men's bodies, the god of whom they are but defaced and leaning monuments. With his hospitable intellect he embraces children, beggars, insane, and scholars, and entertains the thought of all, adding to it commonly some breath and elegance. I think that he should keep a caravansary on the world's highway, where philosophers of all nations might put up, and on his sign should be printed, Entertainment for man, but not for his beast. Enter ye that have leisure and a quiet mind, who earnestly seek the right road. He is perhaps the sanest man, and has the fewest crotchets of any I chance to know. The same yesterday and tomorrow. Of yore we had sauntered and talked, and effectually put the world behind us, for he was pledged to no institution in it, freeborn, ingenuous. Whichever way we turned, it seemed that the heavens and the earth had met together, since he enhanced the beauty of the landscape. A blue-robed man, whose fittest roof is the overarching sky which reflects his serenity. I do not see how he can ever die. Nature cannot spare him. Having each some shingles of thought well dried, we sat and whittled them, trying our knives, and admiring the clear yellowish grain of the pumpkin pine. We waded so gently and reverently, or we pulled together so smoothly, that the fishes of thought were not scared from the stream, nor feared any angler on the bank but came and went grandly, like the clouds which float through the western sky, and the mother-of-pearl flocks which sometimes form and dissolve there. There we worked, revising mythology, rounding a fable here and there, and building castles in the air for which earth offered no worthy foundation. Great looker, great expector, to converse with whom was a New England night's entertainment, Ah, such discourse we had, hermit and philosopher, and the old settler I have spoken of. We three, 
It expanded and racked my little house. I should not dare to say how many pounds weight there was above the atmospheric pressure on every circular inch. It opened its seams so that they had to be caulked with much dullness thereafter to stop the consequent leak. But I had enough of that kind of oakum already picked. There was one other with whom I had solid seasons, long to be remembered, at his house in the village, and who looked in upon me from time to time, but I had no more for society there. There, too, as everywhere, I sometimes expected the visitor who never comes. The Vishnu Purana says, The householder is to remain at eventide in his courtyard as long as it takes to milk a cow, or longer, if he pleases, to await the arrival of a guest. I often performed this duty of hospitality, waited long enough to milk a whole herd of cows, but did not see the man approaching from the town. End of chapter 14「Walden by Henry David Thoreau」Chapter 15 Winter Animals When the ponds were firmly frozen, they afforded not only new and shorter routes to many points, but new views from their surfaces of the familiar landscape around them. When I crossed Flint's Pond, after it was covered with snow, Though I had often paddled about and skated over it, it was so unexpectedly wide and so strange that I could think of nothing but Baffin's Bay. The Lincoln Hills rose up around me at the extremity of a snowy plain, in which I did not remember to have stood before, and the fishermen, at an indeterminable distance over the ice, moving slowly about with their wolfish dogs, passed for sealers, or Eskimo or in misty weather loomed like fabulous creatures, and I did not know whether they were giants or pygmies. I took this course when I went to lecture in Lincoln in the evening, traveling in no road and passing no house between my own hut and the lecture room. In Goose Pond, which lay in my way, a colony of muskrats dwelt and raised their cabins high above the ice, though none could be seen abroad when I crossed it. Walden, being like the rest, usually bare of snow, or with only shallow and interrupted drifts on it, was my yard where I could walk freely when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level elsewhere, and the villagers were confined to their streets. There, far from the village street, and, except at very long intervals from the jingle of sleigh bells, I slid and skated as in a vast moose-yard well-trodden, overhung by oak woods and solemn pines bent down with snow, or bristling with icicles. For sounds in winter nights, and often in winter days, I heard the forlorn but melodious note of a hooting owl indefinitely far, such a sound as the frozen earth would yield if struck with a suitable plectrum. The very lingua vernacula, of Walden Wood, and quite familiar to me at last, though I never saw the bird while it was making it. I seldom opened my door in a winter evening without hearing it. Hoo hoo hoo! Horror hoo! sounded sonorously, and the first three syllables accented somewhat like how do do, or sometimes hoo hoo only. One night in the beginning of winter, before the pond froze over, about nine o'clock, I was startled by the loud honking of a goose, and stepping to the door, heard the sound of their wings like a tempest in the woods, as they flew low over my house. They passed over the pond toward Fairhaven, seemingly deterred from settling by my light, their commodore honking all the while with a regular beat. Suddenly, an unmistakable cat-owl from very near me, with the most harsh and tremendous voice I ever heard from any inhabitant of the woods, responded at regular intervals to the goose, 
as if determined to expose and disgrace this intruder from Hudson's Bay by exhibiting a greater compass and volume of voice in a native, and boo-hoo him out of conquered horizon. What do you mean by alarming the citadel at this time of night consecrated to me? Do you think I am ever caught napping at such an hour, and that I have not got lungs and a larynx as well as yourself? Boo-hoo! 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 It was one of the most thrilling discords I ever heard, and yet, if you had a discriminating ear, there were in it the elements of a conquered such as these plains never saw nor heard. I also heard the whooping of the ice in the pond, my great bedfellow in that part of Concord, as if it were restless in its bed and would fain turn over, were troubled with flatulency and bad dreams, or I was waked by the cracking of the ground by the frost, as if someone had driven a team against my door and in the morning would find a crack in the earth a quarter of a mile long and a third of an inch wide. Sometimes I heard the foxes as they ranged over the snow crust in moonlight nights in search of a partridge or other game, barking raggedly and demoniacally like forest dogs, as if laboring with some anxiety or seeking expression, struggling for light and to be dogs outright and run freely in the streets. For if we take the ages into our account, may there not be a civilization going on among brutes as well as men? They seem to me to be rudimental, burrowing men, still standing on their defense, awaiting their transformation. Sometimes one came near to my window, attracted by my light, barked a vulpine curse at me, and then retreated. Usually the red squirrel, Sciurus Hudsonius waked me in the dawn, coursing over the roof and up and down the sides of the house, as if sent out of the woods for this purpose. In the course of the winter I threw out half a bushel of ears of sweet corn, which had not got ripe, on to the snow crust by my door, and was amused by watching the motions of the various animals which were baited by it. In the twilight and the night the rabbits came regularly and made a hearty meal. All day long the red squirrels came and went, and afforded me much entertainment by their maneuvers. One would approach at first warily through the shrub oaks, running over the snow crust by fits and starts, like a leaf blown by the wind, now a few paces this way, with wonderful speed and waste of energy, making inconceivable haste with his trotters, as if it were for a wager, and now as many paces that way, but never getting on more than half a rod at a time, and then suddenly pausing, with the ludicrous expression and a gratuitous somerset, as if all the eyes in the universe were eyed on him, for all the motions of a squirrel, even in the most solitary recesses of the forest, imply spectators as much as those of a dancing girl wasting more time in delay and circumspection than would have sufficed to walk the whole distance. I never saw one walk, and then suddenly, before you could say Jack Robinson, he would be in the top of a young pitch-pine, winding up his clock and chiding all imaginary spectators, soliloquizing and talking to all the universe at the same time, for no reason that I could ever detect or he himself was aware of, I suspect. At length he would reach the corn, and, selecting a suitable ear, frisk about in the same uncertain trigonometrical way to the topmost stick of my woodpile, before my window, where he looked me in the face, and there sit for hours supplying himself with a new ear from time to time, nibbling at first voraciously and throwing the half-naked cobs about, till at length he grew more dainty still and played with his food, tasting only the inside of the kernel, and the ear, which was held balanced over the stick by one paw, slipped from his careless grasp and fell to the ground, when he would look over at it with a ludicrous expression of uncertainty, as if suspecting that it had life, with a mind not made up whether to get it again, or a new one, or be off, 
now thinking of corn, then listening to hear what was in the wind. So the little impudent fellow would waste many an ear in a forenoon, till at last, seizing some longer and plumper one, considerably bigger than himself, and skillfully balancing it, he would set out with it to the woods, like a tiger with a buffalo, by the same zigzag course and frequent pauses, scratching along with it as if it were too heavy for him and falling all the while, making its fall a diagonal between a perpendicular and horizontal, being determined to put it through at any rate, a singularly frivolous and whimsical fellow, and so he would get off with it to where he lived, perhaps carry it to the top of a pine tree forty or fifty rods distant and I would afterwards find the cobs strewn about the woods in various directions. At length the jays arrived, whose discordant screams were heard long before, as they were warily making their approach an eighth of a mile off, and in a stealthy and snaking manner they flit from tree to tree, nearer and nearer, and pick up the kernels which the squirrels have dropped. Then, sitting on a pitch-pine bough, they attempt to swallow in their haste a kernel which is too big for their throats and chokes them, and after great labor they disgorge it, and spend an hour in the endeavor to crack it by repeated blows with their bills. They were manifestly thieves, and I had not much respect for them. But the squirrels, though at first shy, went to work as if they were taking what was their own. Meanwhile also came the chickadees in flocks, which, picking up the crumbs the squirrels had dropped, flew to the nearest twig, and, placing them under their claws, hammered away at them with their little bills, as if it were an insect in the bark, till they were sufficiently reduced for their slender throats. A little flock of these titmice came daily to pick a dinner out of my woodpile, or the crumbs at my door, with faint flitting, lisping notes like the tinkling of icicles in the grass, or else with sprightly day-day-day, or, more rarely in spring-like days, a wiry summer Phoebe from the woodside. They were so familiar that at length one alighted on an armful of wood which I was carrying in, and pecked at the sticks without fear. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment, while I was hoeing in a village garden, and I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet I could have worn. The squirrels also grew at last to be quite familiar, and occasionally stepped upon my shoe when that was the nearest way. When the ground was not yet quite covered, and again near the end of winter, when the snow was melted on my south hillside and about my woodpile, the partridges came out of the woods morning and evening to feed there. Whichever side you walk in the woods, the partridge bursts away on whirring wings, jarring the snow from the dry leaves and twigs on high, which comes sifting down in the sunbeams like golden dust, for this brave bird is not to be scared by winter. It is frequently covered up by drifts, and it is said sometimes plunges from on wing into the soft snow, where it remained concealed for a day or two. I used to start them in the open land also, where they had come out of the woods at sunset to bud the wild apple trees. They will come regularly every evening to particular trees where the cunning sportsman lies in wait for them, and the distant orchards next the woods suffer thus not a little. I am glad that the partridge gets fed at any rate. It is nature's own bird, which lives on buds and diet drink. In dark winter mornings, or in short winter afternoons, I sometimes heard a pack of hounds, threading all the woods with hounding cry and yelp, unable to resist the instinct of the chase, and the note of the hunting horn at intervals, proving that man was in the rear. The woods ring again and yet no fox bursts forth on to the open level of the pond, nor following pack pursuing their Acteon. And perhaps at evening I see the hunters returning with a single brush trailing from their sleigh for a trophy, seeking therein. 
They tell me that if the fox would remain in the bosom of the frozen earth, he would be safe, or if he would run in a straight line away, no foxhound could overtake him. But having left his pursuers far behind, he stops to rest and listen till they come up, and when he runs he circles round to his old haunts, where the hunters await him. Sometimes, however, he will run upon a wall many rods, and then leap off to one side, and he appears to know that water will not retain his scent. A hunter told me that he once saw a fox pursued by hounds burst out on to Walden when the ice was covered with shallow puddles, run part way across, and then return to the same shore. Ere long the hounds arrived, but here they lost the scent. Sometimes a pack hunting by themselves would pass my door and circle round my house and yelp and hound without regarding me, as if afflicted by a species of madness, so that nothing could divert them from the pursuit. Thus they circle until they fall upon the recent trail of a fox, for a wise hound will forsake everything else for this. One day a man came to my hut from Lexington to inquire after his hound, that had made a large track, and had been hunting for a week by himself. But I fear that he was not the wiser for all I told him, for every time I attempted to answer his questions, he interrupted me by asking, What do you do here? He had lost a dog, but found a man. One old hunter, who has a dry tongue, who used to come to bathe in Walden once every year when the water was warmest, and at such times looked in upon me, told me that many years ago he took his gun one afternoon and went out for a cruise in Walden Wood, and as he walked the Whalen Road he heard the cry of hounds approaching, and ere long a fox leaped the wall into the road, and as quick as thought leaped the other wall out of the road, and his swift bullet had not touched him. Some way behind came an old hound and her three pups in full pursuit, hunting on their own account, and disappeared again in the woods. Late in the afternoon, as he was resting in the thick woods south of Walden, he heard the voice of the hounds far over toward Fairhaven, still pursuing the fox. And on they came, their hounding cry, which made all the woods ring, sounding nearer and nearer, now from Well Meadow, now from Baker Farm. For a long time he stood still and listened to their music, so sweet to a hunter's ear, when suddenly the fox appeared, threading the solemn aisles with an easy coursing pace, whose sound was concealed by a sympathetic rustle of the leaves. Swift and still, keeping the round, leaving his pursuers far behind, and, leaping upon a rock amid the woods, he sat erect and listening, with his back to the hunter. For a moment compassion restrained the latter's arm, but that was a short-lived mood, and as quick as thought can follow thought, his piece was leveled and whang! The fox, rolling over the rock, lay dead on the ground. The hunter still kept his place and listened to the hounds. Still on they came, and now the near woods resounded through all their aisles with their demoniac cry. At length the old hound burst into view with muzzle to the ground and snapping the air as if possessed, and ran directly to the rock. But, spying the dead fox, she suddenly ceased her hounding, as if struck dumb with amazement, and walked round and round him in silence. And one by one her pups arrived, and, like their mother, were sobered into silence by the mystery. Then the hunter came forward and stood in their midst and the mystery was solved. They waited in silence while he skinned the fox, then followed the brush a while, and at length turned off into the woods again. That evening a western squire came to the conquered hunter's cottage to inquire for his hounds, and told how for a week they had been hunting on their own account from western woods. The conquered hunter told him what he knew and offered him the skin, but the other declined it and departed. He did not find his hounds that night, but the next day learned that they had crossed the river and put up at a farmhouse for the night, whence, having been well fed, they took their departure early in the morning. 
The hunter who told me this could remember one Sam Nutting, who used to hunt bears on Fairhaven ledges and exchange their skins for rum in Concord Village, who told him even that he had seen a moose there. Nutting had a famous foxhound named Burgoyne. He pronounced it Burgoyne, which my informant used to borrow. In the Wast Book of an old trader of this town, who was also a captain, town clerk, and representative, I find the following entry. January 18th, 1742-3. John Melvin, credit by one Gray Fox, 0-2-3. They are not now found here, and in his ledger, February 7th, 1743, Hezekiah Stratton has credit by one half a cat skin, zero dash one dash four and a half. Of course, a wild cat, for Stratton was a sergeant in the old French war and would not have got credit for hunting a less noble game. Credit is given for deer skins also, and they were daily sold. One man still preserves the horns of the last deer that was killed in this vicinity and another has told me the particulars of the hunt in which his uncle was engaged. The hunters were formerly a numerous and merry crew here. I remember well one gaunt nimrod who would catch up a leaf by the roadside and play a strain on it wilder and more melodious, if my memory serves me, than any hunting horn. At midnight, when there was a moon, I sometimes met with hounds in my path prowling about the woods, which would skulk out of my way as if afraid and stand silent amid the bushes till I had passed. Squirrels and wild mice disputed for my store of nuts. There were scores of pitch pines around my house, from one to four inches in diameter, which had been gnawed by mice the previous winter, a Norwegian winter for them, for the snow lay long and deep, and they were obliged to mix a large proportion of pine bark with their other diet. These trees were alive and apparently flourishing at midsummer, and many of them had grown a foot, though completely girdled, but after another winter such were without exception dead. It is remarkable that a single mouse should thus be allowed a whole pine tree for its dinner, gnawing round instead of up and down it but perhaps it is necessary in order to thin these trees, which are wont to grow up densely. The hares, Lepus Americanus, were very familiar. One had her form under my house all winter, separated from me only by the flooring, and she startled me each morning by her hasty departure when I began to stir. Thump, 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 striking her head against the floor timbers in her hurry. They used to come round my door at dusk to nibble the potato parings which I had thrown out, and were so nearly the color of the ground that they could hardly be distinguished when still. Sometimes in the twilight I alternately lost and recovered sight of one sitting motionless under my window. When I opened my door in the evening, off they would go with a squeak and a mounce. Near at hand they only excited my pity. One evening one sat by my door, two paces from me, at first trembling with fear, yet unwilling to move. A poor wee thing, lean and bony, with ragged ears and sharp nose, scant tail and slender paws. It looked as if nature no longer contained the breed of nobler bloods, but stood on her last toes. Its large eyes appeared young and unhealthy, almost dropsical. I took a step, and, lo, away it scud with an elastic spring over the snow crust, straightening its body and its limbs into graceful length, and soon put the forest between me and itself. The wild, free venison asserting its vigor and the dignity of nature. Not without reason was its slenderness. Such, then, was its nature. Lepus levipes, lightfoot some think. What is a country without rabbits and partridges? They are among the most simple and indigenous animal products, ancient and venerable families, known to antiquity as to modern times. 
of the very you and substance of nature, nearest allied to leaves and to the ground, and to one another. It is either winged or it is legged. It is hardly as if you had seen a wild creature when a rabbit or a partridge bursts away, only a natural one, as much to be expected as rustling leaves. The partridge and the rabbit are still sure to thrive, like true natives of the soil, whatever revolutions occur. If the forest is cut off, the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment, and they become more numerous than ever. That must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Our woods teem with them both, and around every swamp may be seen the partridge or rabbit walk, beset with twiggy fences and horsehair snares, which some cowboy tends. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of Walden for this LibriVox recording is in the public domain Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter sixteen The Pond in Winter After a still winter night I awoke with the impression that some question had been put to me which I had been endeavoring in vain to answer in my sleep as what, how, when, where but there was dawning nature, in whom all creatures live, looking in at my broad windows with serene and satisfied face, and no question on her lips. I awoke to an answered question, to nature and daylight. The snow lying deep on the earth, dotted with young pines, and the very slope of the hill on which my house is placed, seemed to say, forward. Nature puts no question, and answers none which we mortals ask. She has long ago taken her resolution. O Prince, our eyes contemplate with admiration, and transmit to the soul the wonderful and varied spectacle of this universe. The night veils without doubt a part of this glorious creation, but day comes to reveal to us this great work which extends from earth even into the plains of the ether. Then to my morning work. First I take an axe and pail and go in search of water, if that be not a dream. After a cold and snowy night it needed a divining rod to find it. Every winter the liquid and trembling surface of the pond, which was so sensitive to every breath, and reflected every light and shadow, becomes solid to the depth of a foot or a foot and a half, so that it will support the heaviest teams, and perchance the snow covers it to an equal depth, and it is not to be distinguished from any level field. Like the marmots in the surrounding hills, it closes its eyelids and becomes dormant for three months or more. Standing on this snow-covered plain, as if in a pasture amid the hills, I cut my way first through a foot of snow, and then a foot of ice, and open a window under my feet, where, kneeling to drink, I look down into the quiet parlor of the fishes, pervaded by a softened light as through a window of ground glass, with its bright sanded floor the same as in summer. There a perennial waveless serenity reigns, as in the amber twilight sky corresponding to the cool and even temperament of the inhabitants. Heaven is under our feet, as well as over our heads. Early in the morning, while all things are crisp with frost, men come with fishing reels and slender lunch, and let down their fine lines through the snowy field to take pickerel and perch, wild men, who instinctively follow other fashions and trust other authorities than their townsmen and by their goings and comings stitch towns together in parts where else they would be ripped. They sit and eat their luncheon in stout fear knots on the dry oak leaves on the shore, as wise in natural lore as the citizen is in artificial. They never consulted with books, and know and can tell much less than they have done. The things which they practice are said not yet to be known. Here is one fishing for pickerel with grown perch for bait. 
you look into his pail with wonder as into a summer pond, as if he kept summer locked up at home, or knew where she had retreated. How, pray, did he get these in midwinter? Oh, he got worms out of rotten logs since the ground froze, and so he caught them. His life itself passes deeper in nature than the studies of the naturalist penetrate, himself a subject for the naturalist. The latter raises the moss and bark gently with his knife in search of insects. The former lays open logs to the core with his axe, and moss and bark fly far and wide. He gets his living by barking trees. Such a man has some right to fish, and I love to see nature carried out in him. The perch swallows the grub worm, the pickerel swallows the perch, and the fisherman swallows the pickerel, and so all the chinks in the scale of being are filled. When I strolled around the pond in misty weather, I was sometimes amused by the primitive mode which some ruder fisherman had adopted. He would perhaps have placed alder branches over the narrow holes in the ice, which were four or five rods apart and an equal distance from the shore, and having fastened the end of the line to a stick to prevent its being pulled through, have passed the slack line over a twig of the alder a foot or more above the ice and tied a dry oak leaf to it, which, being pulled down, would show when he had a bite. These alders loomed through the mist at regular intervals as you walked halfway round the pond. Ah, the pickerel of Walden! When I see them lying on the ice, or in the well which the fisherman cuts in the ice, making a little hole to admit the water, I am always surprised by their rare beauty as if they were fabulous fishes. They are so foreign to the streets, even to the woods, foreign as Arabia to our conquered life. They possess a quite dazzling and transcendent beauty which separates them by a wide interval from the cadaverous cod and haddock whose fame is trumpeted in our streets. They are not green like the pines, nor gray like the stones, nor blue like the sky. But they have to my eyes, if possible, yet rarer colors, like flowers and precious stones, as if they were the pearls, the animalized nuclei, or crystals of the Walden water. They, of course, are Walden all over and all through, are themselves small Waldens in the animal kingdom, Waldenses. It is surprising that they are caught here, that in this deep and capacious spring, far beneath the rattling teams and chases and tinkling sleighs that travel the Walden road, this great golden emerald fish swims. I never chanced to see its kind in any market. It would be the cynosure of all eyes there. Easily, with a few convulsive quirks, they give up their watery ghosts, like a mortal translated before his time to the thin air of heaven. As I was desirous to recover the long-lost bottom of Walden Pond, I surveyed it carefully before the ice broke up, early in forty-six, with compass and chain and sounding line. There have been many stories told about the bottom, or rather no bottom, of this pond, which certainly had no foundation for themselves. It is remarkable how long men will believe in the bottomlessness of a pond without taking the trouble to sound it. I have visited two such bottomless ponds in one walk in this neighborhood. Many have believed that Walden reached quite through to the other side of the globe. Some who have lain flat on the ice for a long time, looking down through the elusive medium, perchance with watery eyes into the bargain, and driven to hasty conclusions by the fear of catching cold in their breasts, have seen vast holes into which a load of hay might be driven, if there were anybody to drive it, the undoubted source of the sticks and entrance to the infernal regions from these parts. Others have gone down from the village with a fifty-six and a wagon-load of inch rope, but yet have failed to find any bottom, for while the fifty-six was resting by the way, they were paying out the rope in the vain attempt to fathom their truly immeasurable capacity for marvelousness. But I can assure my readers that Walden has a reasonably tight bottom at a not unreasonable, though at an unusual, 
depth. I fathomed it easily with a cod line and a stone weighing about a pound and a half, and could tell accurately when the stone left the bottom, by having to pull so much harder before the water got underneath to help me. The greatest depth was exactly 102 feet, to which may be added the five feet which it has risen since, making it 107. This is a remarkable depth for so small an area, yet not an inch of it can be spared by the imagination. What if all ponds were shallow? Would it not react on the minds of men? I am thankful that this pond was made deep and pure for a symbol. While men believe in the infinite, some ponds will be thought to be bottomless. A factory owner, hearing what depth I had found, thought that it could not be true, for judging from his acquaintance with dams, sand would not lie at so steep an angle. But the deepest ponds are not so deep in proportion to their area as most suppose, and if drained would not leave very remarkable valleys. They are not like cups between the hills, for this one, which is so unusually deep for its area, appears in a vertical section through its center not deeper than a shallow plate. Most ponds emptied would leave a meadow no more hollow than we frequently see. William Gilpin, who is so admirable in all that relates to landscapes, and usually so correct, standing at the head of Loch Fyne in Scotland, which he describes as a bay of salt water, sixty or seventy fathoms deep, four miles in breadth, and about fifty miles long, surrounded by mountains, observes, if we could have seen it immediately after the diluvian crash, or whatever convulsion of nature occasioned it, before the waters gushed in, what a horrid chasm must it have appeared! So high is heaved the tumid hills, so low down sunk a hollow bottom, broad and deep, capacious bed of waters. But if, using the shortest diameter of Loch Fine, we apply these proportions to Walden, which, as we have seen, appears already in a vertical section only like a shallow plate, it will appear four times as shallow. So much for the increased horrors of the chasm of Loch Fine when emptied. No doubt many a smiling valley with its stretching cornfields occupies exactly such a horrid chasm from which the waters have receded, though it requires the insight and the farsight of the geologist to convince the unsuspecting inhabitants of this fact. Often an inquisitive eye may detect the shores of a primitive lake in the low horizon hills, and no subsequent elevation of the plain have been necessary to conceal their history. But it is easiest, as they who work on the highways know, to find the hollows by the puddles after a shower. The amount of it is, the imagination, give it the least license, dives deeper and soars higher than nature goes. So, probably, the depth of the ocean will be found to be very inconsiderable compared with its breadth. As I sounded through the ice, I could determine the shape of the bottom with greater accuracy than is possible in surveying harbors, which do not freeze over, and I was surprised at its general regularity. In the deepest part there are several acres more level than almost any field which is exposed to the sun, wind, and plough. In one instance, on a line arbitrarily chosen, the depth did not vary more than one foot in thirty rods, and generally near the middle I could calculate the variation for each one hundred feet in any direction beforehand, within three or four inches. Some are accustomed to speak of deep and dangerous holes, even in quiet sandy ponds like this, but the effect of water under these circumstances is to level all inequalities. The regularity of the bottom, and its conformity to the shores and the range of the neighboring hills, were so perfect that a distant promontory betrayed itself in the soundings quite across the pond, and its direction could be determined by observing the opposite shore. Cape becomes bar and plain shoal, and valley and gorge, deep water and channel. When I had mapped the pond by the scale of ten rods to an inch, and put down the soundings, more than a hundred in all, I observed this remarkable coincidence. 
having noticed that the number indicating the greatest depth was apparently in the center of the map i laid a rule on the map lengthwise and then breadthwise and found to my surprise that the line of greatest length intersected the line of greatest breadth exactly at the point of greatest depth notwithstanding that the middle is so nearly level the outline of the pond far from regular and the extreme length and breadth were got by measuring into the coves and i said to myself who knows but this hint would conduct to the deepest part of the ocean as well as of a pond or puddle is not this the rule also for the height of mountains regarded as the opposite of valleys we know that a hill is not highest at its narrowest part of five coves three or all which had been sounded were observed to have a bar quite across their mouths and deeper water within so that the bay tended to be an expansion of water within the land not only horizontally but vertically and to form a basin or independent pond the direction of the two capes showing the course of the bar every harbor on the seacoast also has its bar at its entrance in proportion as the mouth of the cove was wider compared with its length the water over the bar was deeper compared with that in the basin given then the length and breadth of the cove and the character of the surrounding shore and you have almost elements enough to make out a formula for all cases in order to see how nearly i could guess with this experience at the deepest point in a pond by observing the outlines of a surface and the character of its shores alone i made a plan of white pond which contains about forty-one acres and like this has no island in it nor any visible inlet or outlet and as the line of greatest breadth fell very near the line of least breadth where two opposite capes approached each other and two opposite bays receded i ventured to mark a point a short distance from the latter line but still on the line of greatest length as the deepest the deepest part was found to be within one hundred feet of this still farther in the direction to which i had inclined and was only one foot deeper namely sixty feet of course a stream running through or an island in the pond would make the problem much more complicated if we knew all the laws of nature we should need only one fact or the description of one actual phenomenon to infer all the particular results at that point now we know only a few laws and our result is vitiated not of course by any confusion or irregularity in nature but by our ignorance of essential elements in the calculation our notions of law and harmony are commonly confined to those instances which we detect but the harmony which results from a far greater number of seemingly conflicting but really concurring laws which we have not detected is still more wonderful the particular laws are as our points of view as to the traveller a mountain outline varies with every step and it has an infinite number of profiles though absolutely but one form even when cleft or bored through it is not comprehended in its entireness what i have observed of the pond is no less true in ethics it is the law of average such a rule of the two diameters not only guides us toward the sun in the system and the heart in man but draws lines through the length and breadth of the aggregate of a man's particular daily behaviors and waves of life into his coves and inlets and where they intersect will be the height or depth of his character perhaps we need only to know how his shores trend and his adjacent country or circumstances to infer his depth and concealed bottom if he is surrounded by mountainous circumstances an achillean shore whose peaks overshadow and are reflected in his bosom they suggest a corresponding depth in him but a low and smooth shore proves him shallow on that side in our bodies a bold projecting brow falls off to and indicates a corresponding depth of thought also there is a bar across the entrance of our every cove or particular inclination each is our harbor for a season in which we are detained and partially landlocked 
These inclinations are not whimsical usually, but their form, size, and direction are determined by the promontories of the shore, the ancient axes of elevation. When this bar is gradually increased by storms, tides, or currents, or there is a subsidence of the waters so that it reaches to the surface, that which was at first but an inclination in the shore, in which a thought was harbored, becomes an individual lake cut off from the ocean, wherein the thought secures its own conditions, changes perhaps from salt to fresh, becomes a sweet sea, dead sea, or a marsh. At the advent of each individual into this life, may we not suppose that such a bar has risen to the surface somewhere? It is true we are such poor navigators that our thoughts, for the most part, stand off and on upon a harborless coast, are conversant only with the bites of the bays of poesy, or steer for the public ports of entry, and go into the dry docks of science, where they merely refit for this world and no natural currents concur to individualize them. As for the inlet or outlet of Walden, I have not discovered any but rain and snow and evaporation, though perhaps with a thermometer and a line such places may be found, for where the water flows into the pond it will probably be coldest in summer and warmest in winter. When the icemen were at work here in 46 and 47, the cakes sent to the shore were one day rejected by those who were stacking them up there, not being thick enough to lie side by side with the rest, and the cutters thus discovered that the ice over a small space was two or three inches thinner than elsewhere, which made them think that there was an inlet there. They also showed me in another place what they thought was a leech hole, through which the pond leaked out under a hill into a neighboring meadow, pushing me out on a cake of ice to see it. It was a small cavity under ten feet of water, but I think that I can warrant the pond not to need soldering till they find a worse leak than that. One has suggested that if such a leech hole should be found, its connection with the meadow, if any existed, might be proved by conveying some colored powder or sawdust to the mouth of the hole, and then putting a strainer over the spring in the meadow, which would catch some of the particles carried through by the current. While I was surveying, the ice, which was sixteen inches thick, undulated under a slight wind like water. It is well known that a level cannot be used on ice. At one rod from the shore, its greatest fluctuation, when observed by means of a level on land, directed toward a graduated staff on the ice, was three-quarters of an inch, though the ice appeared firmly attached to the shore. It was probably greater in the middle. Who knows, but if our instruments were delicate enough, we might detect an undulation in the crust of the earth. When two legs of my level were on the shore, and the third on the ice, and the sights were directed over the latter, a rise or fall of the ice of an almost infinitesimal amount made a difference of several feet on a tree across the pond. When I began to cut holes for sounding, there were three or four inches of water on the ice, under a deep snow which had sunk it thus far but the water began immediately to run into these holes and continued to run for two days in deep streams which wore away the ice on every side and contributed essentially if not mainly to dry the surface of the pond for as the water ran in it raised and floated the ice this was somewhat like cutting a hole in the bottom of a ship to let the water out. When such holes freeze, and a rain succeeds, and finally a new freezing forms a fresh smooth ice over all, it is beautifully modeled internally by dark figures shaped somewhat like a spider's web, what you may call ice rosettes, produced by the channels worn by the water flowing from all sides to a center. Sometimes also, when the ice was covered with shallow puddles, I saw a double shadow of myself, one standing on the head of the other, one on the ice, the other on the trees or hillside. While yet it is cold January, and snow and ice are thick and solid, the prudent landlord comes from the village to get ice to cool his summer drink. Impressively, even pathetically wise, 
to foresee the heat and thirst of July, now in January, wearing a thick coat and mittens, when so many things are not provided for. It may be that he lays up no treasures in this world which will cool his summer drink in the next. He cuts and saws the solid pond, unroofs the house of fishes, and carts off their very element and air held fast by chains and stakes like corded wood through the favoring winter air to wintry cellars to underlie the summer there it looks like solidified azure as far off it is drawn through the streets these ice-cutters are a merry race full of jest and sport and when i went among them they were wont to invite me to saw pit fashion with them i standing underneath in the winter of forty six forty seven there came a hundred men of hyperborean extraction swooped down on our pond one morning with many carloads of ungainly looking farming tools sleds ploughs drill barrows turf knives spades saws rakes and each man was armed with a double pointed pike staff such as is not described in the new england farmer or the cultivator I did not know whether they had come to sow a crop of winter rye or some other kind of grain recently introduced from Iceland. As I saw no manure, I judged that they meant to skim the land, as I had done, thinking the soil was deep and had lain fallow long enough. They said that a gentleman farmer, who was behind the scenes, wanted to double his money, which, as I understood, amounted to half a million already but in order to cover each one of his dollars with another, he took off the only coat, I the skin itself of Walden Pond, in the midst of a hard winter. They went to work at once, ploughing, barrowing, rolling, furrowing, in admirable order, as if they were bent on making this a model farm. But when I was looking sharp to see what kind of seed they dropped into the furrow, a gang of fellows by my side suddenly began to hook up the virgin mould itself, with a peculiar jerk, clean down to the sand, or rather the water, for it was a very springy soil, indeed all the terra firma there was, and haul it away on sleds. And then I guessed that they must be cutting peat in a bog. So they came and went every day, with a peculiar shriek from the locomotive, from and to some point of the polar regions, as it seemed to me, like a flock of arctic snowbirds. But sometimes Squaw Walden had her revenge, and a hired man, walking behind his team, slipped through a crack in the ground down towards Tartarus, and he who was so brave before suddenly became but the ninth part of a man, almost gave up his animal heat, and was glad to take refuge in my house and acknowledge that there was some virtue in a stove. Or sometimes the frozen soil took a piece of steel out of a ploughshare, or a plough got set in the furrow, and had to be cut out. To speak literally, a hundred Irishmen with Yankee overseers came from Cambridge every day to get out the ice. They divided it into cakes by methods too well known to require description, and these, being sledded to the shore, were rapidly hauled off on to an ice platform, and raised by grappling irons and block and tackle, worked by horses, on to a stack as surely as so many barrels of flour, and there placed evenly side by side, and row upon row, as if they formed the solid base of an obelisk designed to pierce the clouds. They told me that in a good day they could get out a thousand tons, which was the yield of about one acre deep ruts and cradle holes were worn in the ice as on terra firma by the passage of the sleds over the same track and the horses invariably ate their oats out of cakes of ice hollowed out like buckets they stacked up the cakes thus in the open air in a pile thirty-five feet high on one side and six or seven rods square putting hay between the outside layers to exclude the air for when the wind though never so cold finds a passage through it will wear large cavities leaving slight supports or studs only here and there and finally topple it down at first it looked like a vast blue fort or valhalla but when they began to tuck the coarse meadow hay into the crevices and this became covered with rime and icicles 
It looked like a venerable moss-grown and hoardy ruin built of azure-tinted marble, the abode of winter, that old man we see in the almanac, his shanty as if he had a design to estivate with us. They calculated that not twenty-five percent of this would reach its destination, and that two or three percent would be wasted in the cars. However, a still greater part of this heap had a different destiny from what was intended, for either because the ice was found not to keep so well as was expected, containing more air than usual, or for some other reason it never got to market. This heap, made in the winter of 46-47, and estimated to contain 10,000 tons, was finally covered with hay and boards, and though it was unroofed the following July, and a part of it carried off, the rest remaining exposed to the sun, it stood over that summer and the next winter, and was not quite melted till September 1848. Thus the pond recovered the greater part. Like the water, the Walden ice seen near at hand has a green tint, but at a distance is beautifully blue, and you can easily tell it from the white ice of the river, or the merely greenish ice of some ponds, a quarter of a mile off. Sometimes one of those great cakes slips from the ice-man's sled into the village street and lies there for a week, like a great emerald, an object of interest to wall passers. I have noticed that a portion of Walden which is in the state of water was green will often, when frozen, appear from the same point of view blue. So the hollows about this pond will sometimes in the winter be filled with a greenish water, somewhat like its own but the next day will have frozen blue. Perhaps the blue color of water and ice is due to the light and air they contain, and the most transparent is the bluest. Ice is an interesting subject for contemplation. They told me that they had some in the ice houses at Fresh Pond, five years old, which was as good as ever. Why is it that a bucket of water soon becomes putrid, but frozen remains sweet forever? It is commonly said that this is the difference between the affections and the intellect. Thus for sixteen days I saw from my window a hundred men at work, like busy husbandmen, with teams and horses and apparently all the implements of farming, such a picture as we see on the first page of the almanac. And as often as I looked out I was reminded of the fable of the lark and the reapers, or the parable of the sower and the like, and now they are all gone and in thirty days more probably I shall look from the same window on the pure sea-green Walden water there, reflecting the clouds and trees, and sending up its evaporations in solitude, and no traces will appear that a man has ever stood there. Perhaps I shall hear a solitary loon laugh as he dives and plumes himself, or shall see a lonely fisher in his boat like a floating leaf, beholding his form reflected in the waves, where lately a hundred men securely labored. Thus it appears that the sweltering inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans, of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta, drink at my well. In the morning I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, since whose composition years of the gods have elapsed, and in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. And I doubt if that philosophy is not to be referred to a previous state of existence, so remote is its sublimity from our conceptions. I lay down the book and go to my well for water, and lo, there I meet the servant of the Brahmin, priest of Brahma and Vishnu and Indra, who still sits in his temple on the Ganges reading the Vedas, or dwells at the root of a tree with his crust and water jug. I meet his servant, come to draw water for his master, and our buckets, as it were, grate together in the same well. The pure Walden water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. With favoring winds it is wafted past the sight of the fabulous islands of Atlantis and the Hesperides makes the periplus of hanno and floating by ternate and tidor and the mouth of the persian gulf melts in the tropic gales of the indian seas and is landed in ports of which alexander only heard the names
End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of Walden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 17 Spring. The opening of large tracts by the ice cutters commonly causes a pond to break up earlier, for the water agitated by the wind, even in cold weather, wears away the surrounding ice. But such was not the effect on Walden that year for she had soon got a thick new garment to take place of the old. This pond never breaks up so soon as the others in this neighborhood, on account both of its greater depth and its having no stream passing through it to melt or wear away the ice. I never knew it to open in the course of a winter, not excepting that of 52-53, which gave the pond so severe a trial. It commonly opens about the 1st of April, a week or ten days later than Flint's Pond and Fairhaven, beginning to melt on the north side and in the shallower parts where it began to freeze. It indicates better than any water hereabouts the absolute progress of the season, being least affected by transient changes of temperature. A severe cold of a few days' duration in March may very much retard the opening of the former ponds, while the temperature of Walden increases almost uninterruptedly. A thermometer thrust into the middle of Walden on the 6th of March, 1847, stood at 32 degrees, or freezing point, near the shore at 33 degrees, in the middle of Flint's Pond the same day at 32 and a half degrees, and a dozen rods from the shore in shallow water, under ice a foot thick at 36 degrees. This difference of three and a half degrees between the temperature of the deep water and the shallow in the latter pond, and the fact that a great proportion of it is comparatively shallow, show why it should break up so much sooner than Walden. The ice in the shallowest part was at this time several inches thinner than in the middle. In midwinter, the middle had been the warmest and the ice thinnest there. So also, every one who has waded about the shores of the pond in summer must have perceived how much warmer the water is close to the shore, where only three or four inches deep, than at a little distance out, and on the surface where it is deep, than near the bottom. In spring, the sun not only exerts an influence through the increased temperature of the air and earth, but its heat passes through ice a foot or more thick and is reflected from the bottom in shallow water and so also warms the water and melts the underside of the ice, at the same time that it is melting it more directly above, making it uneven, and causing the air bubbles which it contains to extend themselves upward and downward, until it is completely honeycombed, and at last disappears suddenly in a single spring rain. Ice has its grain as well as wood, and when a cake begins to rot or comb, that is, assume the appearance of honeycomb, whatever may be its position, the air cells are at right angles with what was the water surface. Where there is a rock or a log rising near to the surface, the ice over it is much thinner and is frequently quite dissolved by this reflected heat. And I have been told that in the experiment at Cambridge to freeze water in a shallow wooden pond, though the cold air circulated underneath, and so had access to both sides, the reflection of the sun from the bottom more than counterbalanced this advantage. When a warm rain in the middle of the winter melts off the snow ice from Walden, and leaves a hard, dark or transparent ice on the middle, there will be a strip of rotten, though thicker, white ice, a rod or more wide, about the shores, created by this reflected heat. Also, as I have said, the bubbles themselves within the ice operate as burning glasses to melt the ice beneath. The phenomena of the year take place every day in a pond, on a small scale. Every morning, generally speaking, the shallow water is being warmed more rapidly than the deep, though it may not be made so warm after all, and every evening it is being cooled more rapidly until the morning. The day is the epitome of the year, the night is the winter, 
The morning and evening are the spring and fall, and the noon is the summer. The cracking and booming of the ice indicate a change of temperature. One pleasant morning after a cold night, February 24th, 1850, having gone to Flint's Pond to spend the day, I noticed with surprise that when I struck the ice with the head of my axe, it resounded like a gong for many rods around, or as if I had struck on a tight drumhead. The pond began to boom about an hour after sunrise, when it felt the influence of the sun's rays slanted upon it from over the hills. It stretched itself and yawned like a waking man, with a gradually increasing tumult, which was kept up three or four hours. It took a short siesta at noon, and boomed once more toward night, as the sun was withdrawing his influence. In the right stage of the weather, a pond fires its evening gun with great regularity, but in the middle of the day, being full of cracks, and the air also being less elastic, it had completely lost its resonance, and probably fishes and muskrats could not then have been stunned by a blow on it. The fishermen say that the thundering of the pond scares the fishes and prevents their biting. The pond does not thunder every evening, and I cannot tell surely when to expect its thundering, but though I may perceive no difference in the weather, it does. Who would have suspected so large and cold and thick-skinned a thing to be so sensitive? Yet it has its law to which it thunders obedience when it should, as surely as the buds expand in the spring. The earth is all alive and covered with poplae. The largest pond is as sensitive to atmospheric changes as the globule of mercury in its tube. One attraction in coming to the woods to live was that I should have leisure and opportunity to see the spring come in. The ice in the pond at length begins to be honeycombed, and I can set my heel in it as I walk. Fogs and rains and warmer suns are gradually melting the snow. The days have grown sensibly longer, and I see how I shall get through the winter without adding to my woodpile, for large fires are no longer necessary. I am on the alert for the first signs of spring, to hear the chance note of some arriving bird or the striped squirrel's chirp, for his stores must be now nearly exhausted, or see the woodchuck venture out of his winter quarters. On the 13th of March, after I had heard the bluebird, song sparrow, and redwing, the ice was still nearly a foot thick. As the weather grew warmer, it was not sensibly worn away by the water, nor broken up and floated off, as in rivers. But, though it was completely melted for half a rod in width about the shore, the middle was merely honeycombed and saturated with water so that you could put your foot through it when six inches thick. But by the next day, evening, perhaps, after a warm rain, followed by fog, it would have wholly disappeared, all gone off with the fog, spirited away. One year I went across the middle only five days before it disappeared entirely. In 1845, Walden was first completely open on the 1st of April. In 46, the 25th of March. In 47, the 8th of April. In 51, the 28th of March. In 52, the 18th of April. In 53, the 23rd of March. In 54, about the 7th of April. Every incident connected with the breaking up of the rivers and ponds and the settling of the weather is particularly interesting to us who live in a climate of so great extremes. When the warmer days come, they who dwell near the river hear the ice crack at night with a startling whoop as loud as artillery, as if its icy fetters were rent from end to end, and within a few days see it rapidly going out. So the alligator comes out of the mud with quakings of the earth. One old man, who has been a close observer of nature, and seems as thoroughly wise in regard to all her operations as if she had been put upon the stocks when he was a boy, and he had helped to lay her keel, who has come to his growth and can hardly acquire more of natural lore if he should live to the age of Methuselah, told me, and I was surprised to hear him express wonder at any of nature's operations, for I thought that there were no secrets between them, that one spring day he took his gun and boat 
and thought that he would have a little sport with the ducks. There was ice still on the meadows, but it was all gone out of the river, and he dropped down without obstruction from Sudbury, where he lived, to Fairhaven Pond, which he found unexpectedly covered for the most part with a firm field of ice. It was a warm day, and he was surprised to see so great a body of ice remaining. Not seeing any ducks, he hid his boat on the north or back side of an island in the pond, and then concealed himself in the bushes on the south side to await them. The ice was melted for three or four rods from the shore, and there was a smooth and warm sheet of water with a muddy bottom, such as the ducks love, within, and he thought it likely that some would be along pretty soon. After he had lain still there about an hour, he heard a low and seemingly very distant sound, but singularly grand and impressive, unlike anything he had ever heard, gradually swelling and increasing, as if it would have a universal and memorable ending, a sullen rush and roar, which seemed to him all at once like the sound of a vast body of fowl coming in to settle there, and seizing his gun he started up in haste and excited, but he found to his surprise that the whole body of the ice had started while he laid there, and drifted into the shore, and the sound he had heard was made by its edge grating on the shore, at first gently nibbled and crumbled off, but at length heaving up and scattering its wrecks along the island to a considerable height before it came to a standstill. At length the sun's rays have attained the right angle, and warm winds blow up mist and rain and melt the snowbanks, and the sun, dispersing the mist, smiles on a checkered landscape of russet and white, smoking with incense, through which the traveller picks his way from islet to islet, cheered by the music of a thousand tinkling rills and rivulets, whose veins are filled with the blood of winter, which they are bearing off. Few phenomena gave me more delight than to observe the forms which thawing sand and clay assume in flowing down the sides of a deep cut on the railroad through which I passed on my way to the village, a phenomenon not very common on so large a scale though the number of freshly exposed banks of the right material must have been greatly multiplied since railroads were invented. The material was sand of every degree of fineness, and of various rich colors commonly mixed with a little clay. When the frost comes out in the spring, and even in a thawing day in the winter, the sand begins to flow down the slopes like lava sometimes bursting out through the snow and overflowing it where no sand was to be seen before. Innumerable little streams overlap and interlace one with another, exhibiting a sort of hybrid product which obeys halfway the laws of currents and halfway that of vegetation. As it flows it takes the forms of sappy leaves or vines, making heaps of pulpy sprays a foot or more in depth and resembling, as you look down on them, the laciniated, lobed, and imbricated thalluses of some lichens. Or you are reminded of coral, of leopard's paws or bird's feet, of brains or lungs or bowels, and excrements of all kinds. It is a truly grotesque vegetation, whose forms and color we see imitated in bronze, a sort of architectural foliage more ancient and typical than acanthus, chicory, ivy, vine, or any vegetable leaves, destined perhaps under some circumstances to become a puzzle to future geologists. The whole cut impressed me as if it were a cave with its stalactites laid open to the light. The various shades of the sand are singularly rich and agreeable, embracing the different iron colors, brown, gray, yellowish, and reddish. When the flowing mass reaches the drain at the foot of the bank, it spreads out flatter into strands, the separate streams losing their semi-cylindrical form and gradually becoming more flat and broad, running together as they are more moist, till they form an almost flat sand, still variously and beautifully shaded, but in which you can trace the original forms of vegetation till at length, in the water itself, 
they are converted into banks, like those formed off the mouths of rivers, and the forms of vegetation are lost in the ripple marks on the bottom. The whole bank, which is from twenty to forty feet high, is sometimes overlaid with a mass of this kind of foliage, or sandy rapture, for a quarter of a mile on one or both sides, the produce of one spring day. What makes this sand foliage remarkable is its springing into existence thus suddenly. When I see on the one side the inert bank, for the sun acts on one side first, and on the other this luxuriant foliage, the creation of an hour, I am affected as if in a peculiar sense I stood in the laboratory of the artist who made the world, and me, had come to where he was still at work, sporting on this bank, and with excess of energy strewing his fresh designs about. I feel as if I were nearer to the vitals of the globe, for this sandy overflow is something, such a foliaceous mass as the vitals of the animal body. You find thus in the very sands an anticipation of the vegetable leaf. No wonder that the earth expresses itself outwardly in leaves. It so labors with the idea inwardly. The atoms have already learned this law and are pregnant by it. The overhanging leaf sees here its prototype. Internally, whether in the globe or animal body, it is a moist, thick lobe, a word especially applicable to the liver and lungs and the leaves of fat. Labor, lapsus, to flow or slip downward, a lapsing. Globus, lobe, globe, also, lap, flap, and many other words. Externally, a dry, thin leaf even as the F and V are a pressed and dried B. The radicals of lobe are LB, the soft mass of the B, single-lobed, or capital B, double-lobed, with the liquid L behind it, pressing it forward. In globe, GLB, the guttural G adds to the meaning the capacity of the throat. The feathers and wings of birds are still drier and thinner leaves. Thus also you pass from the lumpish grub in the earth to the airy and fluttering butterfly. The very globe continually transcends and translates itself, and becomes winged in its orbit. Even ice begins with delicate crystal leaves, as if it had flowed into molds which the fronds of water plants have impressed on the watery mirror. The whole tree itself is but one leaf, and rivers are still vaster leaves, whose pulp is intervening earth, and towns and cities are the ova of insects in their axles. When the sun withdraws, the sand ceases to flow. But in the morning, the streams will start once more and branch and branch again into a myriad of others. You here see, perchance, how blood vessels are formed. If you look closely, you observe that first there pushes forward from the thawing mass a stream of softened sand, with a drop-like point like the ball of a finger, feeling its way slowly and blindly downward, until at last, with more heat and moisture, as the sun gets higher, the most fluid portion, in its effort to obey the law to which the most inert also yields, separates from the latter and forms for itself a meandering channel or artery within that in which is seen a little silvery stream glancing like lightning from one stage of pulpy leaves or branches to another and ever and anon swallowed up in the sand it is wonderful how rapidly yet perfectly the sand organizes itself as it flows using the best material its mass affords to form the sharp edges of its channel such are the sources of rivers. In the silicious matter which the water deposits is perhaps the bony system, and in the still finer soil and organic matter the fleshy fiber or cellular tissue. What is man but a mass of thawing clay? The ball of the human finger is but a drop congealed. The fingers and toes flow to their extent from the thawing mass of the body. Who knows what the human body would expand and flow out to 
under a more genial heaven? Is not the hand a spreading palm leaf with its lobes and veins? The ear may be regarded fancifully as a lichen, umbilicaria, on the side of the head with its lobe or drop. The lip, labium, from labor, laps or lapses from the sides of the cavernous mouth. The nose is a manifest congealed drop or stalactite. The chin is still a larger drop, the confluent dripping of the face. The cheeks are a slide from the brows into the valley of the face, opposed and diffused by the cheekbones. Each rounded lobe of the vegetable leaf, too, is a thick and now loitering drop, larger or smaller. The lobes are the fingers of the leaf, and as many lobes as it has, in so many directions it tends to flow, and more heat or other genial influences would have caused it to flow yet farther. Thus it seemed that this one hillside illustrated the principle of all the operations of nature. The maker of this earth but patented a leaf. What Champollion will decipher this hieroglyphic for us, that we may turn over a new leaf at last? This phenomenon is more exhilarating to me than the luxuriance and fertility of vineyards. True, it is somewhat excrementitious in its character, and there is no end to the heaps of liver, light, and bowels, as if the globe were turned wrong side outward. But this suggests, at least, that nature has some bowels, and there again is mother of humanity. This is the frost coming out of the ground. This is spring. It precedes the green and flowery spring as mythology precedes regular poetry. I know of nothing more purgative of winter fumes and indigestions. It convinces me that earth is still in her swaddling clothes and stretches forth baby fingers on every side. Fresh curls spring from the baldest brow. There is nothing inorganic. These fallacious heaps lie along the bank like the slag of a furnace, showing that nature is in full blast within. The earth is not a mere fragment of dead history, stratum upon stratum like the leaves of a book, to be studied by geologists and antiquaries chiefly, but living poetry like the leaves of a tree, which precede flowers and fruit, not a fossil earth, but a living earth compared with whose great central life all animal and vegetable life is merely parasitic. Its throes will heave our exuviae from their graves. You may melt your metals and cast them into the most beautiful mold you can. They will never excite me like the forms which this molten earth flows out into. And not only it, but the institutions upon it are plastic, like clay in the hands of the potter. Ere long, not only on these banks, but on every hill and plain and in every hollow, the frost comes out of the ground like a dormant quadruped from its burrow, and seeks the sea with music or migrates to other climes in clouds. Thaw, with his gentle persuasion, is more powerful than Thor with his hammer. The one melts, the other but breaks in pieces. When the ground was partially bare of snow and a few warm days had dried its surface somewhat, it was pleasant to compare the first tender signs of the infant year just peeping forth with the stately beauty of the withered vegetation which had withstood the winter. Life everlasting, goldenrods, pinweeds, and graceful wild grasses, more obvious and interesting frequently than in summer even, as if their beauty was not ripe till then. Even cotton grass, cattails, mullions, johnswort, hardhack, meadowsweet, and other strong stemmed plants, those unexhausted granaries which entertain the earliest birds, decent weeds at least which widowed nature wears. I am particularly attracted by the arching and sheaf like top of the wool grass. It brings back the summer to our winter memories, and is among the forms which art loves to copy and which in the vegetable kingdom have the same relation to types already in the mind of man that astronomy has. 
It is an antique style, older than Greek or Egyptian. Many of the phenomena of winter are suggestive of an inexpressible tenderness and fragile delicacy. We are accustomed to hear this king described as a rude and boisterous tyrant, but with the gentleness of a lover he adorns the tresses of summer. At the approach of spring the red squirrels got under my house, two at a time, directly under my feet as I sat reading or writing, and kept up the queerest chuckling and chirruping and vocal pirouetting and gurgling sounds that ever were heard and when I stamped they only chirruped the louder, as if past all fear and respect in their mad pranks, defying humanity to stop them. No, you don't. Chickory, chickory. They were wholly deaf to my arguments, or failed to perceive their force, and fell into a strain of invective that was irresistible. The First Sparrow of Spring the year beginning with younger hope than ever. The faint silvery warblings heard over the partially bare and moist fields from the bluebird, the song sparrow, and the red wing, as if the last flakes of winter tinkled as they fell. What at such a time are histories, chronologies, traditions, and all written revelations? The brooks sing carols and glees to the spring. The marsh hawk, sailing low over the meadow, is already seeking the first slimy life that awakes. The sinking sound of melting snow is heard in all dells, and the ice dissolves apace in the ponds. The grass flames up on the hillsides like a spring fire. Et primitus auditur herba imbribus primoribus evocata as if the earth sent forth an inward heat to greet the returning sun. Not yellow, but green is the color of its flame. The symbol of perpetual youth, the grass blade, like a long green ribbon, streams from the sod into the summer, checked indeed by the frost, but anon pushing on again, lifting its spear of last year's hay with the fresh life below. It grows as steadily as the rill oozes out of the ground. It is almost identical with that, for in the growing days of June, when the rills are dry, the grass blades are their channels, and from year to year the herds drink at this perennial green stream, and the mower draws from it betimes their winter supply. So our human life but dies down to its root, and still puts forth its green blade to eternity. Walden is melting apace. There is a canal two rods wide along the northerly and westerly sides, and wider still at the east end. A great field of ice has cracked off from the main body. I hear a song sparrow singing from the bushes on the shore. All it, all it, all it, chip, 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 chit char, che whis, whis, whis. He too is helping to crack it. How handsome the great sweeping curves in the edge of the ice! answering somewhat to those of the shore, but more regular. It is unusually hard, owing to the recent severe but transient cold, and all watered or waved like a palace floor. But the wind slides eastward over its opaque surface in vain, till it reaches the living surface beyond. It is glorious to behold this ribbon of water sparkling in the sun, the bare face of the pond full of glee and youth as if it spoke the joy of the fishes within it, and of the sands on its shore. A silvery sheen, as from the scales of a leuciscus, as it were all one act of fish. Such is the contrast between winter and spring. Walden was dead, and is alive again. But this spring it broke up more steadily, as I have said. The change from storm and winter to serene and mild weather, from dark and sluggish hours to bright and elastic ones, is a memorable crisis which all things proclaim. It is seemingly instantaneous at last. Suddenly an influx of light filled my house, though the evening was at hand, and the clouds of winter still overhung it, and the eaves were dripping with sleety rain. I looked out the window. And lo, where yesterday was cold gray ice, 
there lay the transparent pond, already calm and full of hope as in a summer evening, reflecting a summer evening sky in its bosom, though none was visible overhead, as if it had intelligence with some remote horizon. I heard a robin in the distance, the first I had heard for many a thousand years, methought whose note I should not forget for many a thousand more, the same sweet and powerful song as of yore. Oh, the evening robin at the end of a New England summer day, if I could ever find the twig he sits upon. I mean he, I mean the twig. This, at least, is not the tortoise migratorius. The pitch pines and shrub oaks about my house, which had so long drooped, suddenly resumed their several characters, looked brighter, greener, and more erect and alive, as if effectually cleansed and restored by the rain. I knew that it would not rain any more. You can tell by looking at any twig of the forest, aye, at your very woodpile, whether its winter is past or not. As it grew darker, I was startled by the honking of geese flying low over the woods, like weary travelers getting in late from southern lakes and indulging at last in unrestrained complaint and mutual consolation. Standing at my door, I could hear the rush of their wings. When driving toward my house, they suddenly spied my light, and with hushed clamor, wheeled and settled in the pond. So I came in and shut the door, and passed my first spring night in the woods. In the morning I watched the geese from the door through the mist, sailing in the middle of the pond, fifty rods off, so large and tumultuous that Walden appeared like an artificial pond for their amusement. But when I stood on the shore, they at once rose up with a great flapping of wings at the signal of their commander, and when they had got into rank, circled about over my head, twenty-nine of them, and then steered straight to Canada with a regular honk from the leader at intervals, trusting to break their fast in muddier pools. A plump of ducks rose at the same time, and took the route to the north in the wake of their noisier cousins. For a week I heard the circling, groping clangor of some solitary goose in the foggy mornings, seeking its companion, and still peopling the woods with the sound of a larger life than they could sustain. In April the pigeons were seen again, flying express in small flocks, and in due time I heard the martins twittering over my clearing, though it had not seemed that the township contained so many that it could afford me any, and I fancied that they were peculiarly of the ancient race that dwelt in hollow trees ere white men came. In almost all climes, the tortoise and the frog are among the precursors and heralds of this season, and birds fly with song and glancing plumage, and plants spring and bloom, and winds blow, to correct this slight oscillation of the poles and preserve the equilibrium of nature. As every season seems best to us in its turn, so the coming in of spring is like the creation of cosmos out of chaos, and the realization of the golden age. Eurus ad auroram nabataeque regna resisit, peridaque et radiis juga subdita matutinis. The east wind withdrew to Aurora and the Nabathean kingdom, and the Persian and the ridges placed under the morning rays. Man was born. Whether that artificer of things, the origin of a better world, made him from the divine scene, or the earth, being recent and lately sundered from the high ether, retained some seeds of cognate heaven. A single gentle rain makes the grass many shades greener. So our prospects brighten on the influx of better thoughts. We should be blessed if we lived in the present always and took advantage of every accident that befell us, like the grass which confesses the influence of the slightest dew that falls on it, and did not spend our time in atoning for the neglect of past opportunities, which we call doing our duty. 
We loiter in winter while it is already spring. In a pleasant spring morning all men's sins are forgiven. Such a day is a truce to vice. While such a sun holds out to burn, the vilest sinner may return. Through our own recovered innocence we discern the innocence of our neighbors. You may have known your neighbor yesterday for a thief, a drunkard, or a sensualist, and merely pitied or despised him, and despaired of the world. But the sun shines bright and warm this first spring morning, recreating the world, and you meet him at some serene work, and see how it is exhausted and debauched veins expand with still joy and bless the new day feel the spring influence with the innocence of infancy and all his faults are forgotten there is not only an atmosphere of good will about him but even a savor of holiness groping for expression blindly and ineffectually perhaps like a newborn instinct and for a short hour the south hillside echoes to no vulgar jest. You see some innocent fair shoots preparing to burst from his gnarled rind and try another year's life, tender and fresh as the youngest plant. Even he has entered into the joy of his lord. Why the jailer does not leave open his prison doors? Why the judge does not dismiss his case? Why the preacher does not dismiss his congregation? It is because they do not obey the hint which God gives them, nor accept the pardon which he freely offers to all. A return to goodness, produced each day in the tranquil and beneficent breath of the morning, causes that in respect to the love of virtue and the hatred of vice, one approaches a little the primitive nature of man as the sprouts of the forest which has been felled. In like manner, the evil which one does in the interval of a day prevents the germs of virtues which began to spring up again from developing themselves and destroys them. After the germs of virtue have thus been prevented many times from developing themselves, then a beneficent breath of evening does not suffice to preserve them. As soon as the breath of evening does not suffice longer to preserve them, then the nature of man does not differ much from that of the brute. Men seeing the nature of this man like that of the brute think that he has never possessed the innate faculty of reason. Are those the true and natural sentiments of man? The golden age was first created, which, without any avenger, spontaneously without law, cherished fidelity and rectitude. Punishment and fear were not, nor were threatening words read on suspended brass, nor did the suppliant crowd fear the words of their judge, but were safe without an avenger. Not yet the pine felled on its mountains had descended to the liquid waves that it might see a foreign world, and mortals knew no shores but their own. There was eternal spring, and placid zephyrs with warm blasts soothe the flowers born without seed on the twenty ninth of april as i was fishing from the bank of the river near the nine acre corner bridge standing on the quaking grass and willow roots where the muskrats lurk i heard a singular rattling sound somewhat like that of the sticks which boys play with their fingers when looking up i observed a very slight and graceful hawk like a night hawk alternately soaring like a ripple and tumbling a rod or two over and over, showing the underside of its wings, which gleamed like a satin ribbon in the sun, or like the pearly inside of a shell. This sight reminded me of falconry, and what nobleness and poetry are associated with that sport. The Merlin, it seemed to me it might be called, but I care not for its name. It was the most ethereal flight I had ever witnessed. It did not simply flutter like a butterfly, nor soar like the larger hawks, but it sported with proud reliance in the fields of air. Mounting again and again with its strange chuckle, it repeated its free and beautiful fall, turning over and over like a kite, and then recovering from its lofty tumbling, as if it had never set its foot on terra firma. 
it appeared to have no companion in the universe, sporting there alone, and to need none but the morning and the ether with which it played. It was not lonely, but made all the earth lonely beneath it. Where was the parent which hatched it, its kindred, and its father in the heavens? The tenant of the air, it seemed related to the earth, but by an egg hatched sometime in the crevice of a crag. Or was its native nest made in the angle of a cloud, woven of the rainbow's trimmings and the sunset sky, and lined with some soft midsummer haze caught up from earth, its iry now some cliffy cloud? Beside this I got a rare mess of golden and silver and bright capreous fishes which looked like a string of jewels. Ah, I have penetrated to those meadows on the morning of many a first spring day, jumping from hummock to hummock, from willow root to willow root, when the wild river valley and the woods were bathed in so pure and bright a light as would have waked the dead if they had been slumbering in their graves, as some suppose. There needs no stronger proof of immortality. All things must live in such a light. O death, where was thy sting? O grave, where was thy victory then? Our village life would stagnate if it were not for the unexplored forests and meadows which surround it. We need the tonic of wildness to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk, and hear the booming of the snipe to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds our nest, and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us, because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. We must be refreshed by the sight of inexhaustible vigor, vast and titanic features, the sea-coast with its wrecks, the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees, the thundercloud and the rain which lasts three weeks and produces freshets. We need to witness our own limits transgressed and some life pasturing freely where we never wander. We are cheered when we observe the vulture feeding on the carrion which disgusts and disheartens us, and deriving health and strength from the repast. There was a dead horse in a hollow by the path to my house, which compelled me sometimes to go out of my way, especially in the night when the air was heavy. But the assurance it gave me of the strong appetite and inviolable health of nature was my compensation for this. I love to see that nature is so rife with life that myriads can be afforded to be sacrificed and suffered to prey on one another, that tender organizations can be so serenely squashed out of existence like pulp, tadpoles which herons gobble up and tortoises and toads run over in the road, and that sometimes it has rained flesh and blood. With the liability to accident, we must see how little account is to be made of it. The impression made on a wise man is that of universal innocence. Poison is not poisonous after all, nor are any wounds fatal. Compassion is a very untenable ground. It must be expeditious. Its pleadings will not bear to be stereotyped. Early in May, the oaks, hickories, maples, and other trees just putting out amidst the pine woods around the pond, imparted a brightness like sunshine to the landscape, especially in cloudy days, as if the sun were breaking through mists and shining faintly on the hillsides here and there. On the third or fourth of May I saw a loon in the pond, and during the first week of the month I heard the whippoorwill, the brown thrasher, the veery, the wood peewee, the chewink, and other birds. I had heard the wood thrush long before. The Phoebe had already come once more and looked in at my door and window to see if my house was cavern-like enough for her, sustaining herself on humming wings with clinched talons as if she held by the air while she surveyed the premises. 
the sulphur-like pollen of the pitch pine soon covered the pond and the stones and rotten wood along the shore so that you could have collected a barrelful this is the sulphur showers we hear of even in Kalidas' drama of sacantala we read of rills dyed yellow with the golden dust of the lotus and so the seasons went rolling on into summer as one rambles into higher and higher grass. Thus was my first year's life in the woods completed, and the second year was similar to it. I finally left Walden, September 6th, 1847. End of chapter 17「18 of Walden This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 18 Conclusion To the sick the doctors wisely recommend the change of air and scenery. Thank heaven, here is not all the world. The buckeye does not grow in New England, and the mockingbird is rarely heard here. The wild goose is more of a cosmopolite than we. He breaks his fast in Canada, takes a luncheon in the Ohio, and plumes himself for the night in a southern bayou. Even the bison to some extent keeps pace with the seasons, cropping the pastures of the Colorado only till a greener and sweeter grass awaits him by the Yellowstone. Yet we think that if rail fences are pulled down and stone walls piled up on our farms, Bounds are henceforth set to our lives, and our fates decided. If you are chosen town clerk, forsooth, you cannot go to Tierra del Fuego this summer, but you may go to the land of infernal fire, nevertheless. The universe is wider than our views of it. Yet we should oftener look over the tafferel of our craft like curious passengers, and not make the voyage like stupid sailors picking oakum. The other side of the globe is but the home of our correspondents. Our voyaging is only great circle sailing, and the doctors prescribe for diseases of the skin merely. One hastens to southern Africa to chase the giraffe, but surely that is not the game he would be after. How long, pray, would a man hunt giraffes if he could? Snipes and woodcocks also may afford rare sport but I trust it would be nobler game to shoot oneself. Direct your eye right inward, and you'll find a thousand regions in your mind, yet undiscovered. Travel them, and be expert in home cosmography. What does Africa, what does the West stand for? Is not our own interior white on the chart? Black, though it may prove like the coast when discovered. Is it the source of the Nile, or the Niger, or the Mississippi, or a northwest passage around this continent that we would find? Are these the problems which most concern mankind? Is Franklin the only man who is lost, that his wife should be so earnest to find him? Does Mr. Grinnell know where he himself is? Be rather the Mungo Park, the Lewis and Clark, and Frobisher of your own streams and oceans. Explore your own higher latitudes, with shiploads of preserved meats to support you, if they be necessary, and pile the empty can sky-high for a sign. Were preserved meats invented to preserve meat merely? Nay, be a Columbus to hold new continents and worlds within you, opening new channels, not of trade, but of thought. Every man is the lord of a realm beside which the earthly empire of the Tsar is but a petty state, a hummock left by the ice. Yet some can be patriotic who have no self-respect and sacrifice the greater to the less. They love the soil which makes their graves, but have no sympathy with the spirit which may still animate their clay. Patriotism is a maggot in their heads. What was the meaning of the South Sea exploring expedition, with all its parade and expense, but an indirect recognition of the fact 
that there are continents and seas in the moral world to which every man is an isthmus or an inlet yet unexplored by him, but that it is easier to sail many thousand miles through cold and storm and cannibals in a government ship with five hundred men and boys to assist one than it is to explore the private sea, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, of one's being alone. Edit et extremos alters grute tur iberos, plus haber hic vitae, plus haber ie viae. Let them wander and scrutinize the outlandish Australians. I have more of God, they more of the road. It is not worth the while to go round the world to count the cats in Zanzibar. Yet do this even till you can do better, and you may perhaps find some sims all to which to get at the inside at last. England and France, Spain and Portugal, Gold Coast and Slave Coast, all front on this private sea. But no bark from them has ventured out of sight of land, though it is without doubt the direct way to India. If you would learn to speak all tongues and conform to the customs of all nations, if you would travel farther than all travelers, be naturalized in all climes, and cause the sphinx to dash her head against a stone even, obey the precept of the old philosopher and explore thyself. Herein are demanded the eye and the nerve. Only the defeated and deserters go to the wars cowards that run away and enlist start now on that farthest western way which does not pause at the mississippi or the pacific nor conduct toward a worn-out china or japan but leads on direct a tangent to this sphere summer and winter day and night sundown moon down and at last earth down too it is said that Mirabeau took to highway robbery to ascertain what degree of resolution was necessary in order to place oneself in formal opposition to the most sacred laws of society. He declared that a soldier who fights in the ranks does not require half so much courage as a footpad, that honor and religion have never stood in the way of a well-considered and a firm resolve. This was manly, as the world goes, and yet it was idle, if not desperate. A saner man would have found himself often enough in formal opposition to what are deemed the most sacred laws of society, through obedience to yet more sacred laws, and so have tested his resolution without going out of his way. It is not for a man to put himself in such an attitude to society but to maintain himself in whatever attitude he find himself through obedience to the laws of his being, which will never be one of opposition to a just government, if he should chance to meet with such. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live, and could not spare any more time for that one. It is remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route and make a beaten track for ourselves. I had not lived there a week before my feet wore a path from my door to the pond side, and though it is five or six years since I trod it, it is still quite distinct. It is true, I fear, that others may have fallen into it and so helped to keep it open. The surface of the earth is soft and impressible by the feet of men and so with the paths which the mind travels. How worn and dusty, then, must be the highways of the world, how deep the ruts of tradition and conformity. I did not wish to take a cabin passage, but rather to go before the mast and on the deck of the world, for there I could best see the moonlight amid the mountains. I do not wish to go below now. I learned this by my experiment that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him, 
or the old laws be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense, and he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. In proportion as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. It is a ridiculous demand which England and America make that you shall speak so that they can understand you. Neither men nor toadstools grow so. As if that were important and there were not enough to understand you without them. As if nature could support but one order of understandings, could not sustain birds as well as quadrupeds, flying as well as creeping things, and hush and woe, which Bright can understand, were the best English, as if there were safety and stupidity alone. I fear chiefly, lest my expression may not be extravagant enough, may not wander far enough beyond the narrow limits of my daily experience, so as to be adequate to the truth of which I have been convinced. Extravagance. It depends on how you are yarded. The migrating buffalo, which seeks new pastures in another latitude, is not extravagant like the cow which kicks over the pail, leaps the cow-yard fence, and runs after her calf in milking town. I desire to speak somewhere without bounds, like a man in a waking moment, to men in their waking moments, for I am convinced that I cannot exaggerate enough even to lay the foundation of a true expression. Who that has heard a strain of music feared then, lest he should speak extravagantly any more, forever? In view of the future were possible, we should live quite laxly and undefined in front, our outlines dim and misty on that side, as our shadows reveal an insensible perspiration toward the sun. The volatile truth of our words should continually betray the inadequacy of the residual statement. Their truth is instantly translated. Its literal monument alone remains. The words which express our faith and piety are not definite, yet they are significant and fragrant, like frankincense to superior natures. Why level downward to our dullest perception always and praise that as common sense? The commonest sense is the sense of men asleep, which they express by snoring. Sometimes we are inclined to class those who are once and a half-witted with the half-witted because we appreciate only a third part of their wit. Some would find fault with the morning red if they ever got up early enough. They pretend, as I hear, that the verses of Kabir have four different senses, illusion, spirit, intellect, and the exoteric doctrine of the Vedas but in this part of the world it is considered a ground for complaint if a man's writings admit of more than one interpretation. While England endeavors to cure the potato rot, will not any endeavor to cure the brain rot, which prevails so much more widely and fatally? I do not suppose that I have attained to obscurity, but I should be proud if no more fatal fault were found with my pages on this score than was found with the Walden ice. Southern customers objected to its blue color, which is the evidence of its purity, as if it were muddy, and preferred the Cambridge ice, which is white, but tastes of weeds. The purity men love is like the mists which envelop the earth, and not like the azure ether beyond. Some are dinning in our ears that we are Americans, and moderns generally are intellectual dwarfs compared with the ancients, or even the Elizabethan men. But what is that to the purpose? A living dog is better than a dead lion. Shall a man go and hang himself because he belongs to the race of pygmies, and not be the biggest pygmy that he can? Let everyone mind his own business and endeavor to be what he was made. Why should we be in such desperate haste to succeed and in such desperate enterprises? If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. 
let him step to the music which he hears, however measured far away. It is not important that he should mature as soon as an apple tree or an oak. Shall he turn his spring into summer? If the condition of things which we were made for is not yet, what were any reality which we can substitute? We will not be shipwrecked on a vain reality. Shall we with pains erect a heaven of blue glass over ourselves, though when it is done we shall be sure to gaze still at the true ethereal heaven far above, as if the former were not? There was an artist in the city of Kuru who was disposed to strive after perfection. One day it came into his mind to make a staff. Having considered that in an imperfect work time is an ingredient, but into a perfect work time does not enter, he said to himself, It shall be perfect in all respects, though I should do nothing else in my life. He proceeded instantly to the forest for wood, being resolved that it should not be made of unsuitable material, and as he searched for and rejected stick after stick, his friends gradually deserted him, for they grew old in their works and died, but he grew not older by a moment. His singleness of purpose and resolution, and his elevated piety endowed him without his knowledge with perennial youth. As he made no compromise with time, time kept out of his way and only sighed at a distance because he could not overcome him. Before he had found a stick in all respects suitable, the city of Kuru was a hoary ruin, and he sat on one of its mounds to peel the stick. Before he had given it the proper shape, the dynasty of the Kandahars was at an end, and with the point of the stick he wrote the name of the last of that race in the sand, and then resumed his work. By the time he had smoothed and polished the staff, Kalpa was no longer the pole star, and ere he had put on the ferrule and the head adorned with precious stones, Brahma had awoke and slumbered many times. But why do I stay to mention these things? When the finishing stroke was put to his work, it suddenly expanded before the eyes of the astonished artist into the fairest of all the creations of Brahma. He had made a new system in making a staff, a world with full and fair proportions, in which, though the old cities and dynasties had passed away, fairer and more glorious ones had taken their places. And now he saw by the heap of shavings still fresh at his feet that for him and his work the former lapse of time had been an illusion, and that no more time had elapsed than is required for a single scintillation from the brain of Brahma to fall on and inflame the tinder of a mortal brain. The material was pure, and his art was pure. How could the result be other than wonderful? No face which we can give to a matter will stead us so well at last as the truth. This alone wears well. For the most part, we are not where we are, but in a false position. Through an infinity of our natures we suppose a case and put ourselves into it, and hence are in two cases at the same time, and it is doubly difficult to get out. In sane moments we regard only the facts, the case that is. Say what you have to say, not what you ought. Any truth is better than make-believe. Tom Hyde, the tinker, standing on the gallows, was asked if he had anything to say. Tell the tailors, said he, to remember to make a knot in their thread before they take the first stitch. His companion's prayer is forgotten. However mean your life is, meet it and live it. Do not shun it and call it hard names. It is not so bad as you are. It looks poorest when you are the richest. The fault finder will find fault even in paradise. Love your life poor as it is. You may perhaps have some pleasant, thrilling, glorious hours even in a poor house. The setting sun is reflected from the windows of the almshouse as brightly as from the rich man's abode. The snow melts before its door as early in the spring. I do not see but a quiet mind may live as contentedly there and have as many cheering thoughts as in a palace. 
the town's poor seem to me often to live the most independent lives of any. Maybe they are simply great enough to receive without misgiving. Most think that they are above being supported by the town, but it oftener happens that they are not above supporting themselves by dishonest means, which should be more disreputable. Cultivate poverty like a gardener, like sage. Do not trouble yourself much to get new things, whether clothes or friends. Turn the old, return to them. Things do not change, we change. Sell your clothes and keep your thoughts. God will see that you do not want society. If I were confined to a corner of a garret all my days, like a spider, the world would be just as large to me while I had my thoughts about me. The philosopher said, From an army of three divisions, one can take away its general and put it in disorder. From the man, the most abject and vulgar one cannot take away his thought. Do not seek so anxiously to be developed, to subject yourself to many influences to be played on. It is all dissipation. Humility, like darkness, reveals the heavenly lights. The shadows of poverty and meanness gather round us, and lo, creation widens to our view. We are often reminded that if there were bestowed on us the wealth of Croesus, our aims must still be the same, and our means essentially the same. Moreover, if you are restricted in your range by poverty, if you cannot buy books and newspapers, for instance, you are but confined to the most significant and vital experiences. You are compelled to deal with the material which yields the most sugar and the most starch. It is life near the bone, where it is sweetest. You are defended from being a trifler. No man loses ever, on a lower level, by magnanimity on a higher. Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Money is not required to buy one necessary of the soul. I live in the angle of a leaden wall, into whose composition was poured a little alloy of bell metal. Often, in the repose of my midday, there reaches my ears a confused tintinabulum from without. It is the noise of my contemporaries. My neighbors tell me of their adventures with famous gentlemen and ladies, what notabilities they met at the dinner table. But I am no more interested in such things than in the contents of the Daily Times. The interest and the conversation are about costume and manners chiefly. But a goose is a goose still, dress it as you will. They tell me of California and Texas, of England and the Indies, of the Honorable Mr. Blank of Georgia or of Massachusetts, all transient and fleeting phenomena, till I am ready to leap from their courtyard like the Marmaluke Bay. I delight to come to my bearings, not walk in procession with pomp and parade, in a conspicuous place, but to walk even with the builder of the universe, if I may not to live in this restless, nervous, bustling, trivial nineteenth century, but stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. What are men celebrating? They are all on a committee of arrangements and hourly expect a speech from somebody. God is only the president of the day, and Webster is his orator. I love to weigh, to settle, to gravitate toward that which most strongly and rightfully attracts me. Not hang by the beam of the scale and try to weigh less. Not suppose a case, but take the case that is, to travel the only path I can, and that on which no power can resist me. It affords me no satisfaction to commence to spring an arch before I have got a solid foundation. Let us not play at kitley benders. There is a solid bottom everywhere. We read that the traveler asked the boy if the swamp before him had a hard bottom. The boy replied that it had. But presently the traveler's horse sank in up to the girths, and he observed to the boy, I thought you said that this bog had a hard bottom. So it has, answered the latter, but you have not got halfway to it yet. So it is with the bogs and quicksands of society. But he is an old boy that knows it. 
Only what is thought, said, or done at a certain rare coincidence is good. I would not be one of those who will foolishly drive a nail into mere lath and plastering. Such a deed would keep me awake nights. Give me a hammer and let me feel for the furring. Do not depend on the putty. Drive a nail home and clinch it so faithfully that you can wake up in the night and think of your work with satisfaction, a work at which you would not be ashamed to invoke the muse. So will help you God, and so only. Every nail driven should be as another rivet in the machine of the universe, you carrying on the work. Rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. I sat at a table where were rich food and wine in abundance and obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not, and I went away hungry from the inhospitable board. The hospitality was as cold as the ices. I thought that there was no need of ice to freeze them. They talked to me of the age of the wine and the fame of the vintage, but I thought of an older, a newer, and purer wine, of a more glorious vintage, which they had not got and could not buy. The style, the house and grounds, and entertainment passed for nothing with me. I called on the king but he made me wait in his hall and conducted like a man incapacitated for hospitality. There was a man in my neighborhood who lived in a hollow tree. His manners were truly regal. I should have done better had I called on him. How long shall we sit in our porticos practicing idle and musty virtues which any work would make impertinent? As if one were to begin the day with long suffering, and hire a man to hoe his potatoes, and in the afternoon go forth to practice Christian meekness and charity with goodness aforethought. Consider the chine of pride and stagnant self-complacency of mankind. This generation inclines a little to congratulate itself on being the last of an illustrious line, and in Boston and London and Paris and Rome, thinking of its long descent, it speaks of its progress in art and science and literature with satisfaction. There are the records of the philosophical societies and the public eulogies of great men. It is the good Adam contemplating his own virtue. Yes, we have done great deeds and sung divine songs which shall never die. That is, as long as we can remember them. The learned societies and great men of Assyria where are they? What youthful philosophers and experimentalists we are! There is not one of my readers who has yet lived a whole human life. These may be but the spring months in the life of the race. If we have had the seven years itch, we have not seen the seventeen-year locust yet in Concord. We are acquainted with a mere pellicle of the globe on which we live. Most have not delved six feet beneath the surface, nor leaped as many above it. We know not where we are. Beside, we are sound asleep nearly half our time. Yet we esteem ourselves wise, and have an established order on the surface. Truly, we are deep thinkers. We are ambitious spirits. As I stand over the insect crawling amid the pine needles on the forest floor and endeavoring to conceal itself from my sight, and ask myself why it will cherish those humble thoughts and hide its head from me who might perhaps be its benefactor, and impart to its race some cheering information, I am reminded of the greater benefactor and intelligence that stands over me, the human insect. There is an incessant influx of novelty into the world, and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. I need only suggest what kind of sermons are still listened to in the most enlightened countries. There are such words as joy and sorrow, but they are only the burden of a psalm sung with a nasal twang, while we believe in the ordinary and mean. We think that we can change our clothes only. It is said that the British Empire is very large and respectable, and that the United States are a first-rate power. We do not believe that a tide rises and falls behind every man which can float the British Empire like a chip, if he should ever harbor it in his mind. 
Who knows what sort of seventeen-year locust will next come out of the ground? The government of the world I live in was not framed like that of Britain in after-dinner conversations over the wine. The life in us is like the water in the river. It may rise this year higher than man has ever known it and flood the parched uplands. Even this may be the eventful year which will drown out all our muskrats. It was not always dry land where we dwell. I see far inland the banks which the stream anciently washed before science began to record its freshets. Every one has heard the story which has gone the rounds of New England, of a strong and beautiful bug which came out of the dry leaf of an old table of apple-tree wood, which had stood in a farmer's kitchen for sixty years, first in Connecticut and afterward in Massachusetts, from an egg deposited in a living tree many years earlier still, as appeared by counting the annual layers beyond it, which was heard gnawing out for several weeks, hatched perchance by the heat of an urn. Who does not feel his faith in a resurrection and immortality strengthened by hearing of this? Who knows what beautiful and winged life, whose egg has been buried for ages under many concentric layers of woodenness in the dead dry life of society, deposited at first in the alburnum of the green and living tree, which has been gradually converted into the semblance of its well-seasoned tomb, heard perchance gnawing out now for years by the astonished family of man, as they sat around the festive board, may unexpectedly come forth from amidst society's most trivial and hand-sold furniture to enjoy its perfect summer life at last. I do not say that John or Jonathan will realize all this, but such is the character of that morrow which mere lapse of time can never make to dawn. The light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is but a morning star. End of chapter 18 Recording by Nick Bulka End of Walden by Henry David Thoreau